welcome back for our next episode of the Battleborn Duckers podcast. Today we're sitting here with uh, my good friend Jason Adams from Beck Sunglasses. Man, Jason's probably one of the hardest working guys I know, so it's taken us quite a bit of time to get Jason on our podcast. We appreciate you coming on, Jason. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company? Uh, my name is Jason, uh, as as Brian referred to. I I, I currently am the president uh, and founder of a company called Bex Sunglasses. We design, manufacture, and distribute lightweight polarized sunglasses for the active lifestyle. That's everywhere from farmer, rancher, rodeo cowboy, blue collar, uh, pretty much everybody that has the same interests and hobbies as myself. And uh, we've been doing it for 12 years now. My background is in construction, uh, rodeo, farming, ranching, and so again, the product is a, is a direct reflection of, of just basically the way I've lived my life. And uh, yeah, man, it's uh, thanks for having me out. Appreciate it. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but man, Brian is always talking about you, man. He has like a little like romance with you <laughs> because he thinks you're like one of the best guys he's ever met because you do a lot of good stuff, man. Yeah, he does. He you're does all over the place. And, I mean, I don't know. He probably haven't, I, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the other podcast, but you're mentioning him quite a bit because of all the stuff you do and because uh, your, your glasses are so good for the hunting community. So, um, uh, first of all, I appreciate that. I, I can't take the credit. We, we yeah. have a, we have a. I'm gonna give it to you. Anyways. Yeah, I'll t- I mean, I should take it. <laughs> you know, I should take all of it, but I better leave some of that. No, we have a great team. You know, my wife is the, is the vice president, and then and then we have we have programmers that, are, and, and I like to I like to I always refer to this. So if you go on like a tour of our of our warehouse, which used to be a horse barn that we converted, nice. right? Uh, we did a lot of work on ourselves, and when I say I, I, I mean we. I was involved in that as well. Um, we, our programmers, uh, our, our our shippers, they all wear cowboy boots, and so I'll go through and I'll be like, hey, here's Allison, or here's Alex, or here's uh, Daisy. You know, their country. You know, and you, you know, and then that's kind of our thing. And so, um, no, it, w- listen. As far as doing doing things, uh, we try and do what we can. That, that's the big thing. I, I've always said I still believe that my father lived his life this way. I feel like if, if you can do something, if you have the resources monetarily or physically or whatever it might be materially, and you can do something, I feel like you should. That, that It's pretty simple. If, if you're in a position to do it, do it. If not, then, then nobody's going to criticize you for it. But if you can and there's some excess... Trying to help out. So when when you run your business, I mean, there's there's several different business models that people run. You know, there's a classic Zappos that they run it kind of like a almost like a party the whole time. They have a alcohol at their their business, and then there's a corporate structure that's very disciplinary and very goal oriented. You're almost like farm lifestyle when you run your business. Huh? Everybody shifts in and gets the job done. Right. So we're a meritocracy, man. Yeah. And 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 this has changed a lot. Over the years, yeah. because the one thing about me, I, I'm not highly educated. No college degree, nothing. My father didn't have a college we degree. We go along. Yeah, so, <laughs> We're right. so, that's why I like. Him. <laughs> so I, I think I think uh, I, I I didn't put a lot of effort in that respect. But ever since I I, I continually read, whether it's a, a new book or or the latest current events or whatever it is, and trying to find out how am I going to that edge, right? And so I think I think the big thing is 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 I've seen the Zappos companies that you referred to and how they run their culture. And we've tried it, and it doesn't work for us. Yeah. And I've seen how the laid back, the Duck Dynasty guys, which a lot of that is on camera, right? Um, that is a little too a little too much freedom. There has to be some accountability. So what I always go back to is there, we're a meritocracy, meaning at Bex, man, you got to produce every day. And, and I, think, I think you would find some people – that have worked here in the past that would say, hey, this is the biggest jerk you've ever met, Jason. Well, <laughs> that might be true, but you got to understand that might be coming from a place where, hey, you were hired to do X, and this is what you were given. And, and this sounds very harsh. Um, and this is what my what, what I expected out of that, mm-hmm. and it didn't work, meaning meaning I, I, I didn't feel like we, we were we – were, it was – it was working and so yeah i'll make a change we have to and so that's the thing with bex is we are a true meritocracy you come in you produce every day last year doesn't matter hey we have a great year or the brand is doing really good that means nothing what are we doing tomorrow what's getting done today because because that's what you got to eat what you kill when we where we're at we're not at oakley 
or not. We don't have that 40, 50 years of brand tradition behind us helping push it. No, man, we're putting our shoulders to the wheel and trying to trying to produce it. So you're you're almost like a sports coach. Like, hey, I'm gonna take you out of the game if you're not playing right. In a sense, yeah. But but the thing is with me is is I will lay it out beforehand. Like yeah. if you're if you're gonna come to work with us at Bex and you never work for me, you work with me. Because I will, man. If we're framing up a, a new part of the warehouse, I'll right there frame it. Yeah. Um, sometimes probably a little, a, probably to my detriment. Rather than focusing on where the business is going, I'll get I'll get my hands dirty a little bit. I love it. I love to just get in it. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, man, it's it's that's what it is. I'll lay it out. Hey, and we use standard operational procedure, which the corporations that you refer to, mm-hmm. they use it. I implemented about six, seven years ago. I love it. I yeah. love it. My father had 800 employees yeah. uh, at, a, at a construction business that he founded. Had he had standard operational procedure, I believe he'd probably lived 10 years longer. Really? But it was just too stressful then. It was just too stressful. He was trying to get everybody to be him, to, uh-huh. to think like him. It's not possible. Not when you have all these things going on. But what you can have, and I like to think of the SOP as an assistant. Mm-hmm. You know, if you post something on the wall right here of what the agenda is for your podcast or whatever it is, we all know it. And Brian can leave the room, but that's Brian or that's Ron's. Like, that's what he wants to see out of this. And well, we can all see that as long as we can read and write, hey, we're good. We just follow it. When I yeah. think one of the things that you have going for you is, is an organization is only going to be as, as good as its, its leadership, right? So it starts at the top. And, and what I see from you is what you, with what you do in the community and with the way you are is there's a servant leadership mentality in that, in that group. So you're, you're here, not just to, you know, so often we come in as, as a company and we're, we're there to make money. That's our, that's our goal. We have to have that as a goal, but you're there really to serve, to help people. And, and you use that as a, as a driver, right? So we could come to you and we say, Hey, Jason, this is what I want. This is what I need. Hey, can you help me out? And it's, that what you've done in the community and, and with your group has, has been so good. I mean, I remember doing a Friends NRA banquet, and you were gracious enough to buy a table for up from us and came in and, and purchased some stuff at the thing. Well, somebody in the Valley had, had passed away that that morning. And I remember you coming in and buying everything we had left just so, so you can make sure that their family is taken care of for the next couple of weeks. And you do that constantly. I mean, it's anything that, that you're asked, and I think – one of the things we've had a conversation before. I'm like, Jason, I, I can't keep coming, coming in and asking you, you know, I can't keep coming in with, Hey, here's my hat in my hand. What do you got for me? And, and your answer to me was, well, it's, we're going to give it to somebody. We might as well make it somebody that we know. And it's been, it's been really great. And I think it, it shows in your business model. It shows when, when I drive down Wapa Valley Boulevard out here, I'm, I'm driving past the horse pasture and that horse pasture has Beck sunglasses signs in the horse pasture because that's the entrance to your, lie, your corporate office. The geese in I, I am. I'm, I'm drooling over the geese that are in the pasture too. But <laughs> yeah, counting bands. There's, that's like the hot spot for geese around here. It is. You know, they it, just love sunglasses. They, they do because they're, it's the best, they're the best sunglasses on the market. And they know it. Dude. They come all the way from Canada to get themselves some nice shades, dude. Waterfowl love Beck sunglasses. Exactly. So hey, if you're a waterfowl hunter, I'd buy a bunch of Beck sunglasses, put them in your blind, so those geese. Will come on in for you. So for every four thousand dollars you, you spend, you shoot one shot. <laughs> it's a new promotion. Everybody loves it. Well, and Jason's kind of he started you really, one shell. Yeah, you started kind of with more of a guerrilla marketing style, right? So you came in and it was the classic, you know, diesel power. Those guys do it. And, you know, you hey, you buy a pair of sunglasses, you're putting for a drawing for. I think he gave a truck away one time, a razor away another time. You gave five thousand dollars in cash another time. And that's, that's part of the promotion. But Jason's, you know, man, Jason is one of those guys that if he says he's going to do it, he's going to step up. And he was unapologetic. He's unapologetic about two things. He's unapologetic about his religion. And he's unapologetic about Tr- Donald Trump being our president. Yeah. And so I remember one day he did a thing and, and he started losing some followers based on, on what he posted on his Facebook page for Bex. And, and what he did, what you did, what you do in return, Jason, to, to just kind of promote that a little bit. Oh, well, we gave a, a, a cap and a, and a dollar bill that said, "In God We Trust," to, to everybody who kind of jumped on that bandwagon. And it was it wasn't a, a little bit. I think it was five thousand hats and five thousand dollars is what he what he gave well, away. And and some of our team, which most of them are still here, some of them are still here, whether it was didn't work out or they moved on to different, you know, that there's always some turnover from little things that you don't expect, but. 
some, they, some of them were pretty frustrated with me. And at the end of the day, to me, it's like, you know what? I don't I'll, like I'll never I will never look back on that. When it comes to when it comes to my savior, I, like it's never a question for me. Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna highlight somebody or if I'm gonna give some credit to somebody, and it's not it's not I, I try not to make it a gaudy thing, but I certainly don't run from it, man. It's like boom, I'm, I'm all in, I'm all in on this, and it's never a question. Like my ideals, I try and stick to them. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I wouldn't be here. We we wouldn't be here. I remember the days, guys. So we started Bex in 2009, and 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 I don't even know that guy anymore. He was crazy. <laughs> I mean, to, 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 to try and do this, to try and do this, this day and age is 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 a suicide mission. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of huge players out there. There's about four companies that that control eyewear. I mean, they control it, top to bottom, front to back, side to side, and. And back then, you know, people were like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure, done. We're doing it. You know, and, and I'm glad that I was that, had that much conviction and that much ambition. Um, looking back now, I'm like, what was I thinking? But 2012, all of these types of things come around. But I remember, man, I remember like it was yesterday, coming home. And I'm a masculine, strong guy. Um, but I do wear my emotions on my sleeve a little bit. And I would, I would be sad, and I would cry, and I would, and I would, and I remember praying, and I tell my heavenly Father, hey, if our customers, the few that we have, and it wasn't very many, and that's the thing, I always remember that. And I talk to our team, whether they've been here for a day or for a ten thousand days, I remember those first customers. I remember the disheartened ones that felt like that they didn't deserve the type of product that they paid for. I remember each and every one of those experiences, and they will be woven into the fabric forever but at the end of the day i remember praying saying hey if they'll be patient with us they're going to get what they deserve they're going to get what they expect eventually but you got to remember in the early days we couldn't afford to hire somebody from oakley i mean we we started with a dollar turned it into two two into four four into eight eight into 16 we built this company that way there was no there was no bank that was going to take a flyer on a sunglass company are you kidding me and so we had to have those customers and that loyalty we had to have it it was it was the vital lifeblood of what we're trying to do here so i remember praying saying hey if they'll be patient with me heavenly father i will do my part and i will i will not stop until that product gets as good because in those days the product was only as good as I knew how to make it because I was the designer. I was a manufacturing guy. I would work, you know, 16-hour days, and then I'd stay up all night dealing with China or with whoever was, you know, creating or producing that product. And I would work. It came to a point where it was, from a health perspective, my wife was done. She was like, I can't do it. I can't watch you do this. Um, and so when, when somebody comes to me and says, man, this is a lot, I get it. Well, and it's funny because I think, you know, I, I'd heard Beck Sunglass because I was in that, that cowboy world. So it's kind of, it was a really niche market for a while, right? And so I remember the way we met you and your wife is we actually, our post office, we have to go pick up our mail. And, you know, we'd get a pair of sunglasses in the mail every once in a while or a check. And we're like, hey, I'm pretty sure you want this check. And so we'd, we'd actually show up at your house and say, hey, here's, here's your check. And, and so we met you that way. But then we really, you know, you done you done a lot for the community and when you do closeouts you keep a lot of that stuff in the community so you give the opportunity to, to for the community to come in and and get some gear for for a really reasonable price you always take care of your your local community i mean we get it we get a discount for being a local i mean that's always a good thing but then man i i will tell you i was a lifelong oakley guy i mean that's all i wore you know i my sunglasses do really good for a long time, but hey, Brian, what's that buzzing sound in here? I don't know what that buzzing sound is, Ron. Is it? No, it's not an airplane. Let's fix it real quick. Do you hear it? Yeah, I hear it. And yeah, there's a reverb. I think it's going to mess up your sound system. I don't think it's in here. It's outside. Oh, maybe it is. <laughs> I, I took them. I thought it was an airplane. We could edit this out, but. I can take the hum out. Can you? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we keep going then. If you can take the hum out. <sighs> but, okay, go ahead. Sorry, man. So, so yeah, so we, uh, I, I went in and uh, I bought my first pair of Buck Peck sunglasses and I put those sunglasses on and I haven't worn another brand of sunglasses since. I'm on, I have three pairs now. Um, and the only reason that I kind of went back to, this, to the new pair is just because hunting wise, um, we had a lot of mirrored, mirrored, 
lenses. And so I will, I like a full frame sunglass. And so I wanted something that wasn't a mirrored lens just because I felt that that gave us an advantage, you know. So, but I will tell you that between me, everything that you, you produce that you can tell the quality that you're, that you're working with. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, you're going out and buying the cheapest hat you can. It's, it's you're sourcing the best quality you can and, and you're paying a premium, but you're not paying a premium over what anybody else is charging. Right. So, so you're paying, you're going to pay a, you know, more than a hundred dollars for a pair of glasses. And it's not, you're not going down to Walmart and getting some cheap glass off the, off the street, but they're, they're going to perform. They're going to last. Um, How many years do you want those glasses though? Um, well, I've had, I've had them for three or four years, the first pair that I have, and they're still, they're still just fine. And hey, you know, from the sunglass world, what's your average life on an average sunglass is like an Oakley. Like they're not three or four years. Yeah. You'd be surprised. It, yeah. It's anywhere from, it's anywhere from six months to, to five and a half years. It just depends on. The I actually have a pair of sunglasses and they were, they've changed their brand now, but they were icicles. Now they're 360 eyewear. Uh, those sunglasses are as old as Cody. So they're 17, almost 18 years yeah. old, and but, they will. but I, I'm good on my, I'm good with my glasses, but I'm also hard on them because you know, we, we do the ranch lifestyle. We do, we're out duck hunting in them. I mean, it's not an easy lifestyle. They're in my pocket yeah, half the time, all the time. I, and, and I'm, I'm in the construction industry. So they're, they're, uh, they're getting worked. And one of the things I like about these sunglasses, is I've never had a pair of sunglasses where I look down at something and I'll lose, almost lose my sunglasses or I have to keep adjusting my face. These stay put. They don't, they don't go anywhere. They fit comfortably under a hard hat, under my cowboy hat. They're just a good product. And, and then you add to that just what you do for everybody else on top of that. And it's just, how do you not give back to somebody that has a superior product? And then on top of it, it's going to help his community out. So I think there's a lot to it. And I think you come from a pretty, your family's pretty strong. Your, your family's pretty, pretty talented. So your dad owned one of the biggest construction companies in Las Vegas. And he turned that into going and buying some, some game preserve properties and stuff like that. Your brother's a, a world champion team roper. Your other What's brother, Randon. Uh, Randon. Yeah. So, cool. so Randon Adams, he was a world champion team roper. I had to watch him rope with the NFR a couple of times. He actually roped with a buddy of mine was Jojo Lamont driver when he was partnering with Jojo. Came out to the NRA banquet too. Yeah. Uh, yep. No, no that's his little brother. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Your other brother, I think, did cutting horses or something like Jojo that, does, and yeah. and he was a champion too, if I remember right. Yeah. And he had one of the hottest, and he, uh, his he had the hottest. His name was Hottish uh, Cutting Horse Studs going on right now, and and he passed away sadly last year. The horse did, but he his lineage will stay around forever. And, and so you've got that, and it's just man, it's you have a powerful family and it's because you guys put in the hard work. I know your dad, the story of your dad is he couldn't get fire hydrants. So he just said, well, I can't get fire hydrants. I'm going to go buy the company. Now I have all the fire hydrants I need, you know, and it's just, I think there's an advantage of having that being surrounded by that business mindset, but man, you've taken it to a next level. If you ask me, I, I think mean, they call it grit nowadays, right? It, it like is. Your, your whole family's gritty. Like it doesn't matter what, what, what there's to do. You just yeah. do it. Well, every, and here's the thing with my family. They're mine. We're all degenerates, man. We're rednecks to the to the to the with a capital R, but they're my rednecks. And, and I'll tell you about my family. There's 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 two sides of that coin. My father was very fiery, uh, very risk averse, right? But um, and my family's still that way. And and, and my my dad wanted champions in every aspect, whatever it was, right? But. There's the other side of that too. That's the reason why we love Trump is because my family will say the things that need to be said to each other, um, to, to, to everybody else. I mean, there, there's, we'll try and be, um, as, 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 as transparent and honest as you can be. And that's always, not always kind of an easy conversation, right? So what you guys are seeing out of my family behind closed doors is every bit as, as every bit as aggressive and as every bit as transparent, but but it's awesome because we always know where you stand with my family, right? Um, the the thing, you know, you mentioned Oakley. And I will say this about Oakley as it compares to our company. Okay. Oakley's awesome, man. I mean, they make a great product. Jim Gennard, who started Oakley, he started uh, as wide-eyed and as ambitious and motivated as, 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 I, as I was or as I am. Now it's James Hands now, right? It's it's owned by Legatica and some of these types of things. And I think if you listen to him or if you follow him, it's it's lost some of that zeal that it had in the beginning that made you a lifer. 
My father-in-law uh, is a lifer, an Oakley guy. Now, he wears Beck's now. <laughs> I was going to say. Otherwise. <laughs> he, he, he wears Beck's now, but, but that's a great brand. Oakley's done a great job because they were creating those soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Maui Gym, great product, right? Costa, good product. I mean, these are all good brands. You'll never hear me say anything bad about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm grateful for these brands. You know, without their quality, uh, we would never be what we are today. And again, that goes back to my passion for saying, hey, we're not just going to go get a product, a screen print a logo on it, and try and sell it for X. I mean, every part of the way was strategic. You know, every single Bex product that you've ever seen is we, we, we designed it, us, uh, from the ground up. And in the early days, that was, that was death by a thousand paper cuts because you have tooling that goes into that. You have the different molds that go into that. You have all of these set up things that when you're a young entrepreneur, you can't afford. You just can't. It's expensive to do it custom. Think about custom things on your truck. Think about custom things on your home. Think about a custom carpenter. I mean, that stuff costs more money, right? So front loaded, I remember getting into a, at our VP at the time. We were at an airport in Asia and I, I finally said, listen, man, he said, why do we have to have, why do we have to have this product's tooling at five different factories? Because it's, you know, $200,000. And at the time, we didn't have that. You yeah. know? I said, listen, if these things light on fire in the middle of the night and we got 10,000 customers and our business our business is dead the next morning if we have all of our eggs in one basket. But again, you don't get that phone call. I do. So I'm going to do these things. I'm going to run it this way to, to, to protect our, our team members so that they have food on the table in the future. I'm thinking ahead. And if that doesn't sit with you, there's the door, man. But that's how we're going to do this. And so, again, these are all little instances that, that are woven into just like Oakley had their fabric. Bex has our fabric. But you also got to realize that, you know, I don't know if you saw when I pulled up today. I got two sawhorses in my truck. So I've been doing a bunch of stuff in my house, building cabinets, all that stuff. That's who we are. Our customer is me. I am our customer. So when we're developing a new product, you said you've been in the construction industry, man, I'll go, I'll go. I'll go cut wood. I'll go build cabinets. I'll go frame something. I'll go do some fabrication, right? I'll do some sheet metal work. My father's a 30 year veteran in the sheet metal industry. My father-in-law, sorry. Yeah. And, and I, and I'll break, I'll break it, cut it, uh, notch it, you name it, man. And I'll, and I'll use those products all along the way. So again, I'm in a sense, our heart is harshest critic. And I do that because at the end of the day, if somebody comes in and says, Hey, this happened, I'll say, okay, I can see that happening. Or I can say, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. I know it didn't happen yeah. because I've been there. I've done it with that same product. So again, it's again, it goes back to just you know knowing your product front and back, knowing your brand, and uh, and living it. Well, and I think that's what there's there's a difference. I mean, and Oakley was back in the day. It was there was a lifestyle that went with with the Oakley brand, right? So it was they did have a market, and 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 they they strayed from that. I think with Bex, I mean, it, it truly is. I mean, you're getting that lifestyle. You're getting that lifestyle back. And and people don't understand that you can come in and you can say, hey, yeah, I get, we do this and we do that. But in the end, if that brand doesn't support what you're doing, you've, you've got a problem. So if I can't go out and, you know, you in the rodeo world, you're if I've got guys going out there and every time I go out, my glasses are uncomfortable. I can't ride in them. You know, yeah, you've got guys supporting your brand and wearing your product, and, and they're they're being endorsed to wear your product. Well, if every time you see them out in the public, they're not wearing your product, there's a problem. Right. And I think a lot of these brands lose sight of that. They they don't make it for function anymore. They make it for what's my profit margin. And so you've designed for function 100, percent and it shows in your product and and your your shirts and your hats and the designs and and there's always something new coming out. And I know you've taken like you've you've been hit pretty hard just with China and all these other things going on lately to, to even just get product in. It's right. Tough. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. How was it going over to China and getting your product done and like how is it affecting you right now? Like cuz I know um, we work with Vortex a lot and me trying to get a Vortex scope right now is really hard. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think I think uh, you know I think going back to the first times I started going, it was scary. It was scary going over there, not knowing what to expect. But again, that's part of that process. You got to risk it to get the biscuit, man. 
And um, and so we, I started going over there. The first time I ever went, I took my mom. It was two weeks after my father had passed away. So here she is grieving. I didn't want to leave her alone, so I, I'm headed to China. She didn't want me to go alone. And so here we are, and we, we did it. We just pounded the pavement factory to factory. Again, it goes back to touching and knowing those materials, knowing your product. Again, I, I, there may come a day... Uh, where, where Bex is overseen by some CEO that's got, you know, a million other things. And I can do that. I can be that guy. I, I've seen how that works. It's not, there's not a, a lot of talent. It's just a different strategy to say, okay, we're going to delegate X and we're going to do this and we're going to watch those financials like Brian's talking about. But again, today, I don't feel like it calls for that. We're not there. You know, we got to continue to understand this product, know this product. But it happened yesterday. As far as materials go, so when you, when you look at an Oakley or you look at some of these, they, they use what's called an AB value rating. Oakley's AB value on clarity, and again, I guess when you're 50 years into this, um, you can do these types of things, but it's a 32. That's the number. Bex's is a 52. And Maui Jim's a 53. So that's the discrepancy in, in optical clarity. But Oakley has done a fantastic job. I mean, you cannot argue with the job that doesn't. But to get ours to that 52, it's a, it's a fanatic uh, focus on, on materials. And we pay more for that. We pay more for that. It cuts into our margins, all that stuff. But to me, pay a premium for quality. Yeah, to me, that's not even an option. As a matter of fact, we were talk- I was talking to my head of product yesterday. I was out walking. We are talking about some things. And we have some military, some OSHA-approved safety lenses that are polarized. And forever, we have used, uh, we've had to use a polycarbonate. But we use nylon polarized in everything else, which is more, and it's, but it's better clarity, and it's more durable. It's more durable because our customer is out there ranching with a branding iron, with a rope snapping back at him when he misses a loop or whatever it is, uh, or you're cutting some wood, or like you said, you're out on the job site laying some pipe, whatever it is. So we the most durable, we got to have it. Like it was never an, it was never a question. Well, he tells me yesterday, hey, well, it looks like we might be able to do this nylon in, in the military stuff. Nobody, nobody, I guess nobody really does it. I said, well, we're we're doing it. If it's even a possibility, it never has been until now. This is kind of a new thing. Sign us up. We're there because it also offers consistency across the entire line of me literally putting my hand on the Bible saying, I can look in that and say, hey, we're using the best materials, most expensive, best materials that I know that is even possible. Well, that's important. Like they're not going to get hurt in the military now as like with other glasses when they could. Right. And the clarity. I mean, polycarbonate is a great material. It doesn't break in the snap. All soldiers need to see then when they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> which is important, man. I pray for those guys every night and women. They're well, awesome. Well, that's a big percentage between 37 and 51. That's like... That's a big gap between being able to see stuff and not being able to see stuff. Like the clarity could be a right. life or death thing. But again, and, and those are things that, that you could always... You could always, we could always highlight that. We don't, we don't really highlight that. You won't see that in any of our marketing material. Well, and that's the thing is because it is an option, but there's only so much. You, you don't want to put a mouthful on a pamphlet or something, right? But like Brian said, and like you probably understand with some of these other brands is, it'd be different if you thought the consumer was buying the glasses truly for those health benefits, which are there, but they're not. It's again. It's it's these days and age. It's it's a, the lifestyle brand. Oakley is who they are because people want to wear Oakleys. Oakley's got the Patrick Mahomes. They have some of these great athletes that do a good job. Yeah. And so I'll never sit there and criticize that. I, I'm applauding that. I'm saying, hey man, that's awesome. We're trying to get to that point because you guys are doing a phenomenal job. But make no mistake about it. A lot of people walk in there. The first question they're asking the people at Sunglass Hut or Cabela's is not, what's the AB value on these glasses. You know, it's like, hey, do you have these in the new hot pink I saw on Instagram yesterday? And so again, you have to play that game. You have to, you have to, you have to try and understand that the the psychological aspect of the consumer. And I, I don't have it figured out. Sweet. Certainly, I don't know. The so name. they're looking more like the style, the frames. You're like, well, the frames are great and all, but like well, but, the, the the glasses. And that's what customers really don't. Well, see, and they're looking to you're still providing that quality. You're selling. They don't know they want. Yeah, it. I mean, yeah, you could discard it and save a few bucks, but no. Nah, so Oakley, Oakley, and Nike, and and all those big conglomerates are selling. They're selling by endorsement more than anything else. I mean, they're not. Nike's product is probably inferior than to a lot of products, and they found that out. There's some running running shoes that people are actually trying to get outlawed from marathons because they're just annihilating. I Nike. What 
your your demographics is a whole oh, different. Spring operator shoes, where they can go faster. No, no, they're super lightweight. They're an ultra shoe, but okay. but with your brand, and I'll put I'll, I'll put a Shazala up against the LeBron James any day of the week. I mean, I, I think they're a superior athlete because their sport is not I'm playing for 20 minutes and I'm done and I go work out. Their their sport is a lifestyle sport, right? You, Hold on, I got you got to you got to start this argument. I was talking to some kid yesterday and he goes, "Well, rodeo is not real athletes." It is, man. These guys, and not only that, but I mean, just the the amount of damage your body goes through. And I don't care what sport you're, what what event you're doing, whether it's a timed event. You know, obviously, a rough stock event is going to be a little bit harder on your body all around. But man, these ropers are, you know, calf ropers, uh, calf ropers, and and steer wrestlers. They're blowing knees out. I'll give you an example stop. of that. Um, so I talked. To, by the way, you guys brought up Shizawa. Matt Shizawa and I grew up together. He actually went to high school and lived in what is now the Beck's office here in Loganville. Great basketball really? player, yeah. And um, so there's a lot of history there. I talked to Matt yesterday. He called me. We, we talked three, four, five times a week. We're like brothers in a sense. Our families are really close. His father, uh, Japanese, uh, taught us how to rope calves and, and was very, very uh, awesome. I mean, not easy, but awesome. And Matt called me yesterday. He was excited because he's been running some conduit and, and, and wiring his own electrical to a casita in his backyard. Again, that's our customer. He, he, was, he was a professional rodeo cowboy. That's what you guys know him, make the finals 10 times, but he's a great family man. And more than that, he's a DIYer, dude. And he's out there and he's doing these types of things. That is, that's what I love. I love talking about that. Um, you know, his rodeo career is not over, but because of his knee. But to, to, to speak about that, so I'm 36. I qualified for the NFR one time. That was about enough for me. After I made it, uh, settled down with my wife, we, we wanted to start a family. But, guys, I, as a team roper, um, rode bulls a little bit when I was younger, but team roper, roped some calves in high school and college. When I wake up in the morning, both of my wrists, the first time I move them after sitting there sleeping all night is some of the most pain you've ever seen in your whole life. Oh my now, it's just part of it. And, and my body, listen, uh, people are like, yeah, you're not a cowboy. You're not country. You wear New Balance or you wear shorts a lot. I'm like, listen, I'm bow-legged and my feet hurt. Like, I'm 36, <laughs> but my whole body hurts. My wrists hurt. My shoulders hurt. I played college football as a quarterback, man. I'm in some pain. Now, not enough to take it to the extreme and go, go. I, you know, I don't take anything except maybe a, a Tylenol every now and then, but, but that's it. But talk about it being a sport. You could have fooled me, man, because my body feels like it's been in a heck of a sport. Right? You like to be more comfortable and cool now? I like to be comfortable. I don't care about being cool. <laughs> Not a bit. I remember being a kid when I was younger, and, and my grandfather was like, just wait till you get older. That belt buckle's not going to seem so nice anymore. He goes, because you don't want to sit down with it on. <laughs> when I put my boots on with my belt buckle, it hurts. Yeah. Like, it hurts. I told my wife the other day, I was roping and roping the other day, and I had just a belt on, like a Levi's belt uh-huh. without a buckle. And they're like, this guy ain't a cowboy. I'm like, this cowboy is likes to be comfortable and stay out of pain, man. Exactly, you know, man. And I got you- plenty of belt buckles, but they all hurt the same, man. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, you know, a lot of the, a lot of times, so you get a LeBron James. So LeBron James, when if he's going to train, or Michael Jordan, or who, whatever baseball player you want to have, and they're going to train, they're going to train with themselves, right? They have to worry about themselves. What's unique about the world of rodeo is not only are you train yourself a lot of times, but you're having to keep livestock and animals, and and you know, as a team roper, a calf roper, a steer wrestler, you're responsible for providing that other animal athlete as well so not only do you have to care for yourself and make sure your body's fit but you you have a whole another group that you're taking care of all, all the time too so you get home and maybe you go to the gym and and michael jordan go to the gym for four hours whatever well you go to the gym for that four hours you got to come home and now you got to feed you got to water you got to make sure your everything supplements. You know, you're, there's a lot that goes into those animal athletes that people would never see behind the scenes. Growing so. hay is not fun. Well, and I don't think I don't think to me, in my opinion, I don't think there's much anything harder. Now you're a fireman, right? I, I did. I have. Yeah, when I was a paramedic, and Ron was a paramedic too. So you you carry the hoses, this and that. You know, it's not just a job. It's a job plus a lot more, right? The thing with a rodeo cowboy or cowgirl 
is you drive all day. You're tired. I mean, think about it. When you have young kids, you don't even really want to go to Cedar City because they're in the car for three hours, this and that. Well, when you're rodeoing, you're going 10, 12 hours. Now, mind you, you might have just missed. And when you do what I do, team rope, and not only just miss, you left $1,000 on the table, and you have to ride together with your partner to save costs. Now, he might not be, he or she might not be super happy with you. So you got some of those psychological, you know, warfare going on there. So then you get to the next one, okay? And then uh, you either win or lose again. Now, granted, whether you got to drive again to another one, it all depends on your schedule. But once you get there, you're beat mentally, emotionally, physically. You're done. You're you eat done. crappy food the whole time. Yeah, and you're done. And then you get there, and like you're saying, it's 11, 11, 30, 12 at night. All you want to do is lay down. Now, going to the gym seems simple compared to this, but now, now you got to take care of that athlete. You got to go, you know, get the stalls. Sometimes break the lock if the office isn't open. You got to get them in there. You got to fill up the muck bucket. You got to carry it all the way in there. You got to go up on the top of your trailer. You got to throw it off. I mean, psychologically, I think it's as mentally um, exhausting as, as anything, but it, it's, again, we were prepared for that. Ken Shizawa, the guy that taught us, my father taught us how to rope and he provided a way for us. But Ken Shizawa from a, from a fundamental or disciplinarian aspect, man, he was big on that. If you missed a calf roping when I was in high school, you picked up a 50 gallon steel drum, you carried it down to the end of the arena back and you did that every time until he put you in a pressure situation that you were successful. I mean, those are the types of things that we did. It wasn't just about being a good athlete or being able to do it with some style. It's, hey, how can you do it when the chips are up against? And so it's no surprise that all of us made the national finals from a small town, Logan, Nevada. And there was four or five of us and we were all competing against each other. And it was just like this little utopia of of pressure in a sense well, that pressure i mean they say pressure built, pressure makes diamonds and that's the thing is if you learn to handle life under pressure ron and i you know both being paramedics you're, you're forced in that situation on a daily basis and so now you yeah, people don't understand i've never been in it so you get that adrenaline rush for most people and they shut down right they can't do anything they can't think straight well certain people yeah, that's, yeah that's well a predominant the, amount of people that shut down the the, the, the the average population because that's their body doesn't know how to deal with that you start talking about professional athletes, like rodeo athletes that have been forced in that pressure situation so much. What we've seen is, is our body actually hyper focuses. So, so you, your body learns to adjust to that adrenaline rush. So that adrenaline rush comes in and man, I'm focused on what I got to do. And it's like, you just, you're like, it's like a superpower almost. And the average population would never understand that. And that's what it takes to win. And that's what it takes to be super successful. Right. You're like five steps down the road, but they're still processing what's going on. Well, and, and I'm m- me, again, me starts at the top, therefore Bex mm-hmm. and, and pretty much anybody that works there. Cause if not, they, they probably don't want to work there much longer because that's the atmosphere. But we are huge proponents of first responders of, of law enforcement. I took that site a long time ago. I know a lot of first responders that are personal friends of mine. And I tell them all the time, Hey man, like, I'm grateful for you. My family is grateful for you because I could never do what you do. Uh, I tell law enforcement, I work out with them all the time. Guys, I, there's not enough thank yous in the world. And what's being what's being done to them these days and age, this day and age is, is ridiculous. It's it's not fair. And quite frankly, it's, 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 it's unacceptable because these guys, every time they leave their house, every time they have a family, they don't know the situation they're going to run into. I, I wish every politician would go work one night in North Las Vegas. One night, two hours, three yeah, hours. On the strip, and then go back down. and then go back and 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 create law, right? And and and, and these types of things. Because to me, um, you know, that legis- legislation and all the things that they're doing would be much different because they would start to understand what these people are going through. Their families, their husbands, their fathers, their wives, um, their sons, their daughters. And it's first responders same way, man, because they have to take that home. And they have to unpack all that stuff. And I don't care how tough you are mentally. It's got to take its toll when you start to see some of these types of things, right? And so we're huge fans of it over there. I can never say enough thank yous. And there's always the argument, well, yeah, they're compensated. Yeah, well, they're not compensated near enough, in my opinion, because what they're doing day in and day out is heroic. Well, and it's funny because as a law enforcement, yeah, I mean, in law enforcement, they've taken a really bad rap for, for a while now. And that's a political statement more than anything else. And but you look at, I've heard the same argument about firefighters, man. Firefighters are overpaid and this and that. What people don't realize is 90% of the firefighters in the United States are volunteer. 
So we live in a community where, with the exception of our fire chief out here, every single person that serves in this, this community is a volunteer. And so it, it was when I was when I was a captain on, on the fire department out here, it was, you know, you're leaving birthday parties. You're getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to, to take care of somebody else's family. And I, I remember spending spent three nights on the mountain during the Carpenter One fire at the beginning of that, and it was, you know, my wife was scared sick because we just lost 14 firefighters on another fire. And so your family is impacted. And my, my family, you know, I, I never wanted to bring it home. So I did it for a long time. I never wanted to bring it home. That was my goal. That's and, tough, man. And so my wife knew that if I came home and she said something to me and I didn't say anything back, just leave me alone. And, and, and you have to, you have to compartmentalize a little bit, but I will tell you that there's, in my opinion, there's not a single firefighter, police officer, military man that's actually served active duty overseas and seen what they've seen. It doesn't have some PTSD. It's, it's just, it comes with, with the territory. A hundred percent. And, and, and what do we, and it always will be there. You know, when I see a vet, when I see one, man, I, I always try and go out of my way. Be, and, and, and it's hard because I think sometimes they, I think they always appreciate it, but it all depends on their reaction. But my, my message to them is always to say like, thank you, sir. Or thank you, ma'am. But, Mind you, there's no way I could ever thank you because you basically have sacrificed your entire life because of exactly what you just said. They come home, and it's never the same. It's never the same. So it's not just two years in Vietnam. It's the rest of your life. Oh, yeah, and you, you, you live know? with it. And it's funny because we talk about you go up and people say thank you for your service. I, I will tell you that Ron and I are the type of people that we were at a, at a meeting one time and somebody brought us up and was talking about this and that and to giving us some accolades and Ron and I were the most uncomfortable people in the yeah, room. It's really hard we, for that. we just, you don't, I guess we don't know how, how to take it. And you're in a world where you're beat up all the time, especially our law enforcement officers, man, they're every single day. They're beat up every single day. Something me and Brian figured out though, um, with starting this podcast and duck hunting and hunting in general, um, is that when we're out in the field hunting, it helps with, you know, stuff that happened in the past. And we talked to some other EMS, some other vets, um, some other police officers, and uh, there's a correlation between all of that um, about being in the field and hunting and uh, helping with those emotions you have to sort through. Because uh, us as men or us in those professions, we don't we don't want to deal with those emotions. We we you know put them down deep. Have you ever, what's that show with the Rock where he's with Kevin Hart and he, he like. What do you do with your emotions? Like, I shove them way down deep, and I just don't look at them. <laughs> and that's what we do as guys. We shove them way down deep. But when you're out there sitting in the quiet in the duck line, you're sitting on the marsh in the quiet, that stuff comes up, and you're able to process it and work through it. And so with vets and police officers and paramedics, um, we love taking them out because you can see they start opening up and they start talking to you, and it's a safe place for them to talk. And then it gets interrupted by shooting, so you don't feel like a wussy. You know, and it, it really helps. Well, us. there's something different about you're out in the field and you're, I think there's something primal about, about the hunting, right? So it's you're out primal, there. Yeah. And, and so it takes us, I think it takes us back to our, to our little roots, right? So we would have to do that to support, to feed ourselves before. Now we just go down to, to Lynn's yeah. down here and, and this is the meat hooker and, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, and grab some, some food and it's easy, right? I, I give him some money. I work for that money. I give him some money. I'm done. But we're out in the field, and it takes us back to that that tribalism. And, I, and we we sat in a duck line one time, and this last year, and we had some a vet with us, and he told me the story about he was out on a hunt, and everybody had left, and he was by himself trying to get his animal, and he thought about how easy it would be to take just turn the gun on himself. And, but those those discussions come up, and it's because we feel more open when we're around our like kind, right? And so. You know, I think cowboys. I and mean, you don't have to worry about those demons being with you when you're all alone, you know, because you're with your friends. And, and, and that, that, that lifestyle with, with Bex, I think the, the Western lifestyle, the cowboy, the rodeo lifestyle, the hunting lifestyle, it's all one. You know, we're all doing kind of the same thing. We're all, you know, you're not going to ha- find a cowboy that doesn't know how to take care of an animal or wouldn't be willing, you know, yeah, okay, it's life. Uh, the life cycle. My kids grew up in a different environment than the kids in Vegas. My kids know that you bring livestock in and you're going to lose some of them. That's just, that's just life. It's not a big, it's not as big of a deal, but a lot of people just don't understand that and never will. And so I think that's where, where there's a disconnect in the hunting world with the, with the anti hunters 
is they don't understand the whole of it. Right. They don't understand the therapy side of it for vets. And then one other thing you're talking about, you, you, you mentioned several times you like working with your hands, you like framing, you like doing the, the, the metal work and you know construction related stuff. And I was thinking about it. I, 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 I kind of started like you. We started a business myself, a real estate business, and it was high pressure. You'd come home, you'd just be this is like mentally fatigued. It's almost like you hit a wall and your brain just couldn't function. It's like you come home, it has this buzzing. It's like, and you can't function. And then, thank goodness, we have wives that can support us. And they're like, hey, listen, well, I'm going to take care of you. You know, I could do anything without my wife. But when you're out like trimming the yard or framing a wall or running an electric or something like that, that's that's therapy, man. It helps you reset. You're able to work through the thoughts, and then you're actually creating something, and it makes you feel good, and then it almost resets you. So next time you can go back in a high pressure situation and you can function higher. It's almost like having a recovery day after a workout. And so like you said, well, I probably shouldn't be framing that wall, but no, I, I disagree with you like wholeheartedly. Sometimes you need to stop what you're doing when you're in a pressure situation. Go frame that wall, have a little recovery, and then you're ready to go back at it again. Right. What well, I think Jason's thinking, he's got. No, that, that's a good point. And, and, but but it, being, being a, a being an owner of a, of a company, and and when you're you, you got people dependent on you, and it's like sometimes you step back and say, "Is this the best thing for those other people?" This is an effective use of my time. Well, yeah, and and I, and I understand that 100. percent But I think you do. I think you need to reset. And I think you need to take time. I mean, Ron and I are, are bad on this right now is sometimes you just need to take time for just you and, and take care of you and your family. And we get going so, so hard and starting the podcast was certainly this has taken a lot of our time, but we're now on, I think four or five different boards. We keep getting added to boards for stuff. And it's just, our answer is, well, if I have to be on the board and, and you're going to take a, a time commitment, we don't have it. And, and I know from a business standpoint, I know people have called you because they need to deal with something. Well, you were up till three o'clock. You're over in China, and so you're on a different schedule. Right. And, and so you're working hard, and, and and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And and to know that your decisions directly affect those people that are eating below you, and that's a big thing. And it it, it can be stressful and way heavy. And I think that's why it's important to get out and do things that you enjoy. The the hunting, whether it's hunting, fishing getting on a team rope and whatever it is to, to kind of break some of that stress a little yeah. bit. That's why I love the conservation group we're with is when we're with a group called wildlife and habitat improvement in Nevada. And, you know, I could pay somebody to go do the same projects I'm doing, you know, um, a week ago, me and Brian, well, not a week ago, a month ago, about we two weeks in, ago. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the deuce nesting. Boxes. Oh yeah. It's been a month and, and a half. We went in a, we went in a kayak around, uh, the Alamo area and stuffed goose boxes full of hay. You know, and that's not something, like, I could, I could probably spend my time better. I could probably hire somebody to do it. But there's some therapeutic effect to being able to go out and do that with a bunch of guys. And then we're also being able to help wildlife. And so that's why I love being part of that wind group is because I'm able to do those projects where it's just, it's just a reset, man. And it feels good when you're done. You know, I mean, <laughs> we were out there and the winds are coming at us at, like, what, 50 miles an hour? I don't know. All I know is I was paddling as hard as I could and I was going backwards. <laughs> So, <laughs> so and we have hay bells in the in the boat in the kayak, and we're we're in the middle of this water, and I was going over the waves, and my kayak was coming up and slapping, and I was like, "This is not safe," but uh, it was fun, man. It's it, good, good memories, yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, th- there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for that resetting. I, I, I probably used to like the odd projects I do more than I do now, just because we did a remodel over the summer, did ninety five percent of ourselves. And, and, and you get burned out, right? And I'm still putting up fans and barn doors and all these things. I mean, still, that's what I'll do today, right? And luckily, my wife, you, you know, I know all of our wives are our biggest supporters, and, and, and they're awesome. I, I couldn't do anything without her. I mean, she works at Bex. She's the VP. We're raising three kids. Who knows? She probably wants some more. I mean, there's just plenty. To, <laughs> there's, there's plenty to do all the time. And you right? guys are running to your kids everywhere all the time. So we're coaching t-ball, uh, press season softball. We're doing a club soccer team. Arbor's in coach pitch, um, you know, and we're trying to teach them manners at home and teach them good chores and, and, and teach them the business. Man, I, I my daughters know exactly what profit is. They have profit and losses for little lemonade stands that they do, and there's these little things, right? But... The one thing, here's the thing as far as what you're saying about people always talk about like sometimes, you know, you don't want to step over a dollar and make a dime and you can hire people to do this. You don't have to do it all yourselves. And it's, 
you know, the money that you would save doing it yourself, you're going to make long term by hiring. I guess I don't understand that yet. I'm not at that point in my life because I keep doing the dollars and cents on 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 making my own cabinets and having, uh, you know, 100 hours of my time or 50 hours of my time and, you know, $1,500 in material versus custom cabinets at 50 grand. Right. And so, again, I, I guess maybe I'm missing something, uh, but I don't think so. And so, again, it comes down to I think you, you end up getting the people that just don't want to put the effort out that say that. And it's easier for them because because they maybe monetarily are in a different position. And that's cool, man. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. People. Hey, we love capitalism. This is still America last time I checked, which is why I love Donald Trump. Now, again, back to Donald Trump, some of the things that he was implementing hurt our business. And I still thought they were the right thing. They were the right thing for my kids and my future's kids because, guys, believe it or not, and I do business with China, but China is dangerous. And I've seen it firsthand, and their intentions are not good for us. No, they're not. And so so some of these things that Trump was doing, I was 100% in support of, even though financially they hurt our business. I don't care because at the end of the day, I can separate the two. Hey, I got children. They're going to be here long after I am, and I love them. Everything I do is for them, 100%. And so – you know, I still like to do a lot of those things myself. Yeah, man, it's time consuming and it's uh, sometimes you don't love it. You're you tired. You're, 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 you're wore, yeah, you're wore out. But, um, you know, one thing I learned a long time ago and, it, and I, was, I was reminded of it the other day. I, I watch Westerns every night. My kids, we, if you're like, what is dad doing on a Friday night? He's watching Westerns, you know, and I watch them all. Uh, I watched Magnificent Seven the other day with Denzel Washington. Dude, it was a good oh, movie. Okay. Such, such a good movie. <laughs> and the, the Indian guy, the Native American guy, he's like, he said, "Where are you? Where are you? Where'd you come from?" And he's like, "I was in a tribe and they kicked me out. My path is different." And and everybody's path is different. Yeah. And so uh, I I always try and perspect per, perception is reality. So that's one thing I always try and keep in mind. And even in our own families, your brother might have a different occupation than you do, and he can. You know, it's, it's, you got to be careful not to compare some of those types of things because everybody's path is different. But again, that's what makes us unique. God gave us those talents for a reason, you know, and so I try and keep that in perspective. I like to go out and do a little work on my hands. You know, I like to read some books. I like to, I don't like the stock market. I'll tell you flat out, do a little bit of it. Don't like it. Don't trust it. You know, nothing about it. Right. But. But again, everybody might have a brother that's really well in the stock market. That's not my thing. That's not my path. You have a brother. One of your brothers is in Bitcoin, isn't he? Isn't he running like some Bitcoin facilities? Yeah. So he, he did that a few years ago, and we set some up there in our in our warehouse. Again, I was trying to help him, so I learned all about it, man. Hooked him up, you know, learned how to run them, learned how to run the electrical, did the whole nine, man. We had it sounded like a freaking war zone in there, just <laughs> all, all day, every day, back and back. So you'd have sunglasses over here, and then there'd be there was a we called it the hot room, and this thing was hot, man. And we had probably. 100 Bitcoin miners, and they're just going. I mean, you walk through there, you were sweating. It was crazy. All but, that stuff. But just to be able to understand. So when he called me and said, hey, this is what's going on. I'm really frustrated and really stressed because he was building huge blockchain facilities. These things were crazy. 100,000 uh, Bitcoin miners back in North Carolina. I wanted to be able to empathize with him. So I went and learned about him. So that when he called me as his brother, he's my big brother, and I love him. We're really close. And he calls me and having a rough day because he didn't have anybody else to turn to. And he he brought up the Ant Niner B9. I want to be like, yeah, man, the B9, I think you could do a lot better with this. And so I wanted to be able to be a good resource for him so I won't learn about it. Hey, so what, the, what kind of hunting traditions do you got in your family? Did you guys grow up hunting or just mainly rodeo? No, so we, we grew up hunting. Um, I love mule deer, man. Mule deer is my... It would be my hunt of choice every time. Mm-hmm. My father loved uh, elk. He was a big bull guy. He loved it. Just grew up loving elk, eating elk. I've got a bunch of elk in my freezer right now. I, we eat 50-50 beef to elk. You know? and, uh, but I love me personally, and I have my brother Dustin. We love mule deer. And everybody in my family hunts. Um, we haven't drawn a tag in Nevada for 10 years, probably six years, seven, eight years. Really? So I don't know what we did to piss somebody off. But, Same thing I did, apparently. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been kind of tough, but we'll still try and go. We, we were able to go, Brett, the brothers and I, we went up to uh, uh, outside of Gunnison, Colorado last year on a mule deer tag. And just, again, we tried to get together and do some of that stuff. It was fun. But we love it. What do you think your daughters? Are they going to be hunters? 
I think like it. I think my so I have two daughters and a son. My middle daughter I think will be a hunter. Uh, my son I think will be a hunter. Uh, my oldest daughter, she she I would take I will take her because it's a good way, right? To yeah. learn to learn how to harvest and be and about our ancestry, be hunters and gatherers. Uh, I don't know that she'll ever be the one pulling the trigger. She's pretty. Uh, she's real tender hearted. She's just a sweet girl. And uh, I don't know that she will or not, but, you know, she's not. She's 10 now, so that yeah. might change. But I'll certainly take her and then help her understand, you know, where 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 everything comes from. I don't know, man. I've seen her on the soccer field. She's a monster when she gets out there. <laughs> yeah, she's, she, it's, it's one of those things, man. She flips the switch and loves it and this and that, but she's just a sweet girl. When it comes to animals. Yeah, she just in every, yeah, in every aspect. Well, you know, that's fun. it's funny because you get those kids, and I have my two boys. I mean, I have three. I have a stepson, too. My stepson's 26 or something like that. But but my old, my middle boy, he's man, he's 100% hardcore. We're going to hunt. We're going to fish. Hey, when are we going fishing? You know, it, that's what he wants to do. My youngest one, he made one duck trip, and we asked him if he wanted to go again. He said, not if I have to get up that early. So it has nothing to do with having to kill something or anything like that. I'm not getting up out of bed before 10 o'clock in the morning, and that's all there is to it. Well, and it's cold and wet. Well, and we, we we hunt hard, and I, and I can't blame him. Ron and I, I mean, we'll be up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I think my kids on the fair weather hunts, like early season duck, when they're wearing short sleeve shirts, and they can take their pants off and wear shorts, and, you know, it's nice down here in, in Moapa. And then, I mean, they have a really good youth hunt down here. I don't know if you knew that. But it's like it's a really good time, man. And the kids get out there and they give guns away and they cook them breakfast and they have a duck calling contest. And then my kids go out and they shoot a couple ducks because it's early season. They give away a gun. Day. And then they go home and they've had a really good experience with, uh, and we were talking about this last podcast with my dad. One of the first times I went on, he was like that. It was cold. We hiked all day. And then it was we didn't get a deer like for the first Five years I went out. I don't know why I keep going. Maybe I'm stupid. Well, and, and my thing is, so, and it's probably mimics yours quite a bit, Jason. And I know it's a little bit easier when you're at home, but, man, you spend a lot of time traveling and making sure your business is running smoothly. I, I worked 24-hour shifts when I was a paramedic when I was younger. And so my kids were young. I, I was gone 10 days a month. I mean, I, I wasn't physically wasn't at home 10 days a month. And I did the fire department thing when I was out here. And, and I spent a lot of time away from my kids. And there's... There's something really rewarding about being able to have my boy in a in a blind with me, or being able to harvest a deer with my with my son. I mean, it, it just it feels like you're kind of paying back all that stuff at once. And so for I I truly treasure the time I get to spend with my kids. Yeah. And Ron, I we we do we hunt a lot during hunting season, and and we take a ton of people out, whether it's first time hunters or it's kids or vets or just people that have never got experienced it before. Because I think it's an important thing. That we all get a chance to do it, and and I will tell you, there's some the coolest experience I've ever had was me and my kid both dropping birds at the same exact time, hmm. and, and and so there's those moments you you can't yeah. you can't get those moments yeah. back, and it's hard because if you want to be successful, it, it, whether it's in business or you know you, I came from the EMS world, but if you want to be successful, you got to sacrifice, and unfortunately, with truly that successful guys. Yeah. Our families are sacrificing right along with us. So well, you're right, and and I'll speak to that a little bit. So um, I, I stick around home more than I ever have now, and 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 it's my kids are at that age, right? I remember Trevor Brazil, the best rodeo cowboy that ever swung a leg over a horse. You know, when his kids got to the age where you know, they were going to school, they were involved in sports. That's what it finally took for him to hang it up. And he still has 10 years left where he can beat those guys. I mean, the guy is awesome, right? But again, um, you know, I stick around for that same reason because my kids are at that age. I will tell you, one of the greatest gifts my father left behind was that was that, was that that example. You know, he was a successful guy, self-made, hard worker, but he was a great dad and he was there. And, and that, that stuck with me and I'll, I've met, I've met a handful of billionaires. I'm not going to say a ton, but I've met a handful of billionaires and I've had conversations with them. And every time, not just sometimes, not just part of the time, every time they always wish they would have spent more time with their kids because they got all the money in the world, but they missed, they missed those experiences from, like you're saying, traveling the world from seven to 16, gone. You, you can't buy it. 
you cannot buy that back. You cannot get that back. You know, before you know it, your son or daughter's 20 going to college and, and they always come back and say, hey, got a great business, got more money than anything, more than I'd ever need. But I wasn't there. And, and it breaks my heart. And it's the one thing I would change. And it's every time. So you look at it that way. It's priceless, man. It's priceless to spend that time with your kids. Now, the goal is, is to, to, to remember that. To in the moment, to be able to, like you said, sacrifice those experiences, sacrifice this business deal, whatever it is. And there's a lot of times I'll leave some money on the table and I never look back because, again, you can make more money. You can't make more memories with your kids. And again, my father, huge credit to him because he he put that in practice. I watched it every day. Well, that's a great that's thing. Huge. Your dad was a good guy. I mean, he did a lot and he did a lot for the community out here and in Vegas. And I know they were in Salt Lake doing a lot of stuff too. I mean, that's. A, Cool thing about when you're successful, you can kind of you can kind of have things and travel. I remember we first moved out in the valley. I'm like, dude, there's there's a jet at our little airport out here. Like, Where the who's, who the heck's that? And it was it was your mom and dad were in town. So so, but it, it, it's it is a good thing. And and you're teaching your kids. I, I've watched it. I've been in that office. So it, you walk into Jason's. So you walk into Bex in their corporate headquarters. And I walk in there one day, and Jason's sitting in front of the TV that they brought in with a PlayStation, and it's him and his brother and a couple other guys playing Madden. You know, sitting sitting on the floor, but his kids are in that in that environment almost every day. So Jason's bringing his kids in. His wife's part of the organization. I know. I don't know if it's still the case, but I know your wife had made the transition from Jason was handling all the sponsorship stuff, and I think Jason would have given away his house if if somebody had called and said that they needed their house. So they made the transition to, to now Haley's. You know, was in charge of that, and and you go to Haley, Haley's. I mean, I, I love her to death. She's awesome. You guys have been super great to us, and and always so kind and and giving to this community. And and I think it's important because your kids see that. Right. And, and so what you're doing is you're building that in your kids for the future. And and so I hope that, that I'm building the same for, thing for my kids. And I think I hope that I'm putting that same out. And Iran are are really that's one of our things is we're always trying to figure out a better way to give back and it's hard. Right? It is. And the hardest thing to do, Ron, and I, yeah. I know you want to probably speak to this, the hardest thing to do in business or in, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, in, in business or charity or philanthropy or any of that stuff is to say no, because it, that's the hardest thing. That was the hardest thing for me to learn. Sometimes you have to say no, whether it's for your sanity, whether it's for the financial uh, health of your firm or whatever it is. But to speak to your Madden thing. So I haven't played Madden. I hadn't played Madden before that for probably 10 years, and I haven't played it since that day. You got beat that bad, huh? Well, we had this we had this guy working for us that, that he played every day, and he was always running his mouth, man. And I tried not to, but one time I said, All right, bring your, when you come tomorrow, I'll bring that game, and I'm going to beat you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you, and you're not going to like it. And I haven't played, but I know how to read a defense, and I know your MO is going to be to blitz every time. And we played two games. He beat me in one, and I finally beat him in the other. But, but the one thing you know, to, to my kids again, this would are oh, you ain't competitive at all, huh? This is what comes back to for my kids, and this is what I try and show them is you talk about culture, zappos, and these kinds of things. I said finally after nine years, man, of doing this and and not taking much. So for for about six years, I never took a paycheck home, never. Now and then for about two three years after that, I made thirty five hundred a month at Bex. That was and, and to me, I was like high on a hog, man. I was doing great, and um, but what I, after all that, what I learned, man, is I and I will tell this to the people at Bex. If somebody ever gives me a strange eye or if they ever act annoyed that my kids are there, my answer is always the same. I'll pull in my office and I say, "Look, if you don't like it, there's a door, and if it bothers you, go start your own company." And I didn't. I wasn't always like that. But at the end of the day, man, um, we're going to run things the way that Bex runs things. And 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 the good news is, is I, everybody loves it. Everybody that's in there, they, they appreciate that culture because it spills over to their family as well. Hey, if your kid's home from school or whatever, bring them on in. There's a toy room over there. Or there's an extra desk. You can put some homework in this and that and the other. Now, we're not a family. Because you put up with things from your family that you never could from 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 your team, you know. Because your blood, somebody yeah. steals from you, this or that, the other. You're gonna you're gonna love them. You're gonna if they're your family. Now your team, you can only do that one or twice, and I can't take it anymore. But but a team works together. A team helps each other out. A yeah. team picks up the slack. And so those are things that we talk about often, you know. And and it's it's not just a one way street. You know, you need to bring your kids in, bring them in. It's cool. 
it's rock and roll. As long as you're getting your stuff done, because we are a true meritocracy, say no more. It's rock and roll. That's so funny. Yeah, that's the same way at uh, my real estate office. Like, um, my wife has to do something. I like, drop the kids off. They'll be fine. You know, my kids run around and they're rowdy, and it's not the normal real estate office. But I don't care. Well, he had. I mean, he got to the point where his wife. His wife and his partner's yeah, wife wouldn't let him have a dog. They wouldn't let him have a do- another dog at the house. So now they have an office dog. So, so they, could, they could get away with that. But no, I think, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think there's a lot to be said. I think kids are missing out nowadays, right? So kids go to school, your parents go to work and it's by necessity. It's not, we, we don't, we're never, we're not in an environment anymore where we can have a mom sit at home. I was very lucky when, when my boys were younger is that my wife didn't have to work. And so she could stay at home with, with the boys and, and spend that time with them. Well, the sacrifice was dad didn't get to come home. And, and so we, we look at that. And if you have the opportunity to bring your kids in and, and just build that, that huge bond with them and spend that time with them and, and create the kids that you want to be in the future, I, th- I think it's going to pay dividends in the end. And, and I think we're missing that in society now. I, well, all the work has to be done in the home today. Because society's not doing any of it. As exactly. a matter of fact, they're, they're trying to undo all of it. And so to me, it's important. To, and again, this is where everybody's path is different. That's that's my decision. You know, I am the steward over those children. Heavenly Father gave me those children to raise them up mm-hmm. and to do the best that I can. So I choose to do that. And that's that's that might not work for the next guy or the next gal. And that's okay. Uh, I'm not going to look over that fence. That's great. But that's what I choose to do. Because in my opinion, the work in the home today is as vital as it's ever been. Because they're going to go out there to this mean, nasty world and it ain't, and they're going to get, they're going to get punched in the mouth a little bit. Right. So we need to make sure that we're doing, you know, uh, we're doing the best that we can while we can and trying to prepare them to go out there and take some of those punches, but not completely come undone know how to pick themselves back up, know how to have conviction, know how to have ideals and and faith. To me, again, that's me, man. And if somebody else is the same way, that's awesome. I love it. If not, that's okay, too. Yeah, I want my kids to enjoy the punches, man. There's nothing like a good fight. Oh, no. Well, well, you know? And I like, think... There's nothing like a good fight and walking away and being tired and beat up and saying, I did it. I made it. My dad used to draw a circle out. So, so I can never, too, huh? I can never punch my brothers in the face. To me, that was my own thing. I uh-huh. could never do that. I never wanted to. Yeah. But I'd wrestle them down. I'd punch them in the ribs anywhere else. But I would never punch my brothers in the face. Your, your dad would draw a circle. He would draw a circle. Fight. My dad was a street fighter, dude. Yeah. And he he uh, he got stabbed in the back when he was uh, in in college. What? He rode bulls and stuff like that. It was kind of a rough deal. He yeah. was tough, man. And he had a scar probably two inches. You know, he scratched my scar, and it was right there in the middle of that. And so, <laughs> so he was used to that. So he knew the best way. If my brothers and I were in a tussle, this and that, he'd just go get some flour, draw a circle out in the grass, or say something, come out here. And I'd always, I'd always tell him, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not falling for this because I'm. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna beat him up. And then you're going to beat me up like this. <laughs> this doesn't end well, man. So we ended up just going to the circle. I'd shake his hands, tell him I love him. We'd both be crying or whatever and then move on. But. Well, I think we're we're all from the same religion, right? So this valley is pretty prominent. And it's, it's really known as a religion that's pretty – it gets pretty rigid. But I think the funny thing is all three of us kind of have that same outlook. We're – we're, we're all kind of on the more on the fringe side of it. We kind of do things our own little way and we still believe that core value of it. But I mean, I, you, people would, if people understood that they, they would look at you and they would say, well, I, he doesn't fit that mold. And I think you don't. And I think it's great. It's, it's refreshing because we can all be part and we don't have to fit a mold and, and we, we all have to live our own lives. And I think one of the things our religion teaches us is the value of a, the value of family and, and, and the importance of that, but B is the, the value of giving back and doing service for others. Right. And, and so you take that to heart and you, and you do that. And it's, it's really clear that, that where your heart is in, in that. And, and I think we have to, uh, uh, we're, we're losing yeah. that battle every single day where they're coming after the religion and they're, and they're trying to, to, to weaken everything right. we have. And so, that, that's why I know you you fight really hard to keep that and, and to keep that attitude. So you'll 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 fight that person in that my, circle, my, huh? Yeah, my philosophy on that is pretty simple. And and again, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. And I think that I think the gospel it's been said is harder for intellectuals. Uh, to me, to me, um, it's pretty simple. It's Christ Church, 
uh, the church is per- therefore the church is perfect. The people aren't. When I go to church on Sunday, it ain't for anybody else. I'm going for my salvation. Uh, I can only worry about my household and anything else. That's that's uh, that's pretty. You know, I I try and have faith. I think we all have struggles. Now it's a gospel of accountability. Some people can't live it, and that's okay. Doesn't mean that they're any less. Uh, loved or any less talented, any less uh, anything. They're they're awesome. It doesn't that doesn't change. Uh, I think we lose sight of that sometimes. I think I think that not just our. I think that's across all denominations. I think everybody. I was just on the ride over here today. I was talking to my brother in law. I've been kind of I've been kind of obnoxious towards my wife lately, and I told my brother in law. I said <laughs> it's because I don't have. I said, I have plenty to do. I don't really have a lot to look forward to. And to me, there's a difference. You get excited to go duck hunting or you get excited to build this cool blind or you get excited to work on hobbies or projects or whatever. Uh, you don't really get excited to fix the leaky pipe sometimes, right? But it's something that needs to be done. And so I was telling my brother-in-law, Jory, he's a great guy, just like me. And I was like, dude, I have been driving my wife nuts lately. So if you got any projects or something, to do, I need something to get excited about because right now I have plenty to do, but nothing to get excited about. And I keep taking it out on my wife. It ain't fair to her. And that's what I told him. I think sometimes as far as the, the gospel goes, mm-hmm. some people don't have enough to do. And if you get to that point, <laughs> and if you get to that point and you're murmuring, come see me, man. I got plenty to do. Exactly. Right? I can light them up for you and your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor. That one that we're always supposed to love. Love thy neighbor as thyself, right? We yeah. lose sight of all those things. But the good news is that we're all imperfect. Absolutely. Right? And so I'll never be the one that criticizing this and that. Hey, Lord and Savior is perfect. Love him. Appreciate him. Grateful for everything he's done. And... Uh, yeah, man, the church is great. People are awesome. I mean, I love those people that come into church that haven't been there in a minute. Like, those are the ones I love to see. I'm like, right on, dude. Welcome back. You need to be here. It's where you're supposed to be. Let's rock and roll. Well, and if you ask me, that's really what the church is. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the most important part that's of the it. church is those people. And, and I think you talk about you don't have anything to do, and there's nothing to look forward to, right? There, there's You have a lot to do, but nothing that, that excites you. The funny thing is, so it's the the disconnect between a husband and wife sometimes. I guarantee you fix that leaky pipe. Your wife's looking forward to that. 100%. So, so it's yeah. it's just that different mindset. And it's hard. It's hard sometimes because we get in our own little world and we get locked up with ourselves. And I think, you know, you have to be willing to step back sometimes and say, hey, this isn't for me. I get it. And and, and as, as men, our, our job is to do a lot of the things that aren't. That, that don't excite us, right? Yeah, they're that, not sexy. That they're not sexy, and and it, man, fun. if it was up to me, I hate plumbing. If it's up to me, so Ron much. and I are <laughs> we're, we're hunting or fishing every single weekend. If it's up to me, right? Yeah. Oh, it makes me say bad words. Yeah. So you say bad plumbing words, anyways. Sucks, man, I don't know what's about it. I hate it, man. It is. But here's the thing. Theoretically, it seems so simple. Oh, it is simple, right? Man. A little Teflon tape, a little plumber's put. But dude, <laughs> it is an art. I don't care what anybody says. I've tried to do it. You guys know Chet Pulsifer? What call him? Uncle yeah. Anytime I got a plumbing project, I know to call Chet now because it doesn't matter how, you know, he'll just kind of smooth. I, I'll be working on something for 24 hours and it'll keep giving me problems. I'll call Chet. He'll just stroll up in there at 30 because he knows where to apply pressure. We're not doing again. Hey, there's that's what makes it awesome. That's what makes your group of friends and your, your soldiers awesome because yeah. he knows the things I don't. Now let's talk about charity, man. The charities you've given to you and how it's helped your business, if it helps your business, or or why you do it. So again, going going back to doing what we can, and 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 we do get quite a few inquiries, you know, and yeah. um, and there's no there's no set, and we and we've tried to put some procedural stuff in that says like, hey, everything needs to fit this cookie cutter. It doesn't always work because everything's so unique. And then some stuff is last minute because it's a situation where it might be a tragedy and, and, and you're trying to. So it all depends. Um, I do believe it. I do. As far as a business uh, from a business uh, like productive business standpoint, mm-hmm. I don't know if it does work or not. I really don't. I, I never have. I never have looked at the data on that and never really cared to because it's, it's not it. a, yeah it's not about that for me it, it all depends on again if we can if we're in a position to do it if mm-hmm. it feels right um but you know you talked about oakley and some of the endorsements earlier we endorse a, a few people just a small and it's usually friends of mine or somebody i believe in in, mm-hmm. in their mission and i want to support that on on that personal level but 
I'd rather give to the Clark County Junior Livestock Association than I would to an endorsee. Yeah. I would. I mean, that's never that's that's easy for me. Um, as far as as far as the decision all day, the mutton busting versus you know Mike Tyson or I that that's a no brainer for me because again, there's only so much and there's not enough to do both. Yeah. usually and so i'll always pick the kids every time or the youth every time or uh, somebody that's in an unfortunate position every time like no questions asked that again might be to my detriment one day but that's okay it's 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 my decision and that's what i feel more comfortable i know that that money's going to go further i just know that it's going to help something you know it's it's going to get used it's going to get utilized it's going to go it's going for the right reason that's why i do that and that's the honest, honest truth, man. You can ask my wife or anybody else. And so, um, but I, as far as it works, I, I, I really can't tell you. We try and do things that give longevity, longevity for the brand. So, mm-hmm. a banner in an arena is great. Yeah. But I'd prefer to have something on a ball cap or on a jacket or a shirt or a belt buckle or a saddle or something that will be seen. Uh, myriad of different times and circumstances than just that one arena because you get a captivated audience to that arena it's great but they'll eventually disperse after that event that 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 banner comes down whatever i'd rather tie the brand to something that's going to get utilized long term Uh, if it's going to be on a pickup truck or on a you know something that's going to be that's going to get some 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 exposure uh, at least in my Logan, Del Nevada, educated, yeah. simple mind of thinking, that makes more sense for us. So if yeah. somebody's saying, hey, here's 500, we, we want a banner for 500, or we want uh, to put your logo on a belt buckle for for 750, I'm going to take the belt buckle every time. You know, because it's going to get seen everywhere that that belt buckle goes. Well, no one leaves every like, hey, did you see that Bex But logo? usually, usually, and here's the thing on that, usually I, 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 I demand... Um, I demand involvement on on the design of the belt buckle because I've worn a lot of belt buckles and I have some beautiful ones and I have some terribly unattractive ones. And I know the type of belt buckle that people are going to want to wear. If our brand is going on a belt buckle, I want to have some say in the design because I want to design something that they're going to want to wear. Because if it just goes into a a cabinet or a shoe closet, then it does not good for us. But when I was looking at the charity standpoint for my business, when we donate... Um, I was talking with a business partner. He's one of my best friends. And I was like, dude, this makes us no money. Like this, this, this does not generate revenue. And he, and he was like, you know, it doesn't matter if it generates revenue or not. It makes me feel good. And so that's why I do it. So from your local, like, you know, simple mindset, you're like, I do it because it makes me feel good. It might not generate revenue, but I like doing it and I have the means to do it. And so I'm going to. Well, and more times than not, you also got to, what I try and remember is more times than not, it's not going to bring you revenue. No. It, it's just not. And so that's not the reason that you do it. And again, we're in that interesting in the middle phase because you think about the big corporations, you think about the big companies, um, they have a budget for that. I don't necessarily love budgets because people want to, <laughs> people want to stick to them. Oh, we so need to get along, man. The, the budget is I approve it. It goes, if not, no, pretty much no. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm flexible to a point, but as far as, Hey, here's a set budget. No, we don't do that because they want to use it every time because the money doesn't want to go away. Right. You see the government do that all the time, but so I'm not, I'm not huge on that. Um, but the big corporations, man, they'd much rather give their, They'd rather give a million dollars to the NFR than they would to Uncle Sam. And, and and that's the reality of it. And people don't want to think of it that way, but that's the truth. Yeah. You know, Bezos has given, you know, Bill Gates and all these guys, you look at it and you're like, oh, my gosh, he's such a great philanthropist. No, he just doesn't want to give that to the government. Yeah, don't don't, don't fool yourself. And so so the way you, so, so it's a two for one for them. No, it's good. But that's yeah. a two for one for them. It's like, hey, I can look like a saint or a savior. And I can also get some tax benefits, or I can I can you know give this to Uncle Sam. Well, every time they're going to say I'm going to give a million dollars to to the to the to the endow in, in the Nevada Division of Wildlife because I'm going to look like uh, whatever, and and the hunters are going to love me, and this and that and the other, and and then I don't have to give it to Uncle Sam. Everybody wins because yeah. I know Uncle Sam's going to give it to you know uh, build some low income housing. I don't know. But to me, nobody else, I, I don't think a lot of people look at it that way, but that's the reality of it because I've seen both sides of it. Yeah, and it is. And I think, uh, when, especially when you're a smaller 
company and you're trying to get that name out there and that brand recognition, you know, I think sometimes when not even necessarily given to the charity, but just you get that some of that swag out there sometimes. I know Scott, um, one of our friends that we took him hunting for the first time this this year, you know, he we did a giveaway with some Bex hats and I had a sticker pack and stuff like that. Well, he ended up with a sticker pack. I will tell you, he's got a Bex hat sitting on his dash. He's got a sticker in his back window now. And, and so he's just super supportive because we've talked several times about what you've meant for the community and what you've done for people. And so for him, he's like, yeah, I want to support that. I want to be part of that. And I think there there's certainly a, an amount of that. I don't think you're ever going to get the bang for the buck that it costs you to do it. I, I just don't think so. And I know you've been really generous. I, I went into you one time. I said, Hey, I need like three or four hats. If you, if you could give me three or four hats, I'm doing a you shoot. I just want to give a win or something. And, and the answer was, well, how many kids are going to be there? And, and it was, you donated a hat for each kid. And for those kids, that was, that was huge. And, and certainly it, you didn't have to. And I don't think it, I don't think it moved the needle on, on your, on your company. I don't ever think it would, but for those kids, that was that was a moment they they got something right. for for their effort, and I and think Bex it's important. Hats are good man. Bex has some good hats, man. I, I've said this when we used to do our podcast. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The hat is the hardest thing to source. It is really, yeah. It's the hardest thing. You can go all over. Now we have some. We have we have two factories that that produce. Uh, probably they produce all of our stuff. None of them are flex fit. We don't use Upon. We don't use Richardson. We don't. Everything's cut and sew from the factory. And these factories, we probably do 80, I would say 80 plus percent of their production. So it's almost like having your own factory without all the overhead. Yeah. I love it. It's it's awesome. Now, one of them's in Vietnam, the other one's in China. And the thing is, is and, I've, and I visit both of them, especially uh, when, when the border's open, I'll, I'll go back. But the hat is the hardest thing to produce because... The Walt Disney's of the world and the Apples and the Amazons of the world, you know, they want to order 10 million caps to give away at a, at, a, at a conference. And so these caps, you know, they want to pay nothing for them. So why would you sit there and put all this craftsmanship in a cap that you're that, that these suppliers of these factories aren't going to make anything on? And it really doesn't matter because Amazon is not asking for the top of the line quality. They just need a cap to go in their swag bag. You got to understand the market share for these factories, they won't want volume. They're no different than anybody else. They want how big is the order, how many pieces of the order, this and that and the other. And it's all offset by volume. So they just want to stitch up a bunch of caps and be done, move on to the next one. So to find a factory that wants to put the type of craftsmanship or the quality into it that we demand, that we expect, is really difficult. A lot of people don't wouldn't think that, and it makes no sense. But when you start to look at it this other way that I'm talking about, it does. Because you're the exception, not the rule. You want a high quality cap that's like amazing, perfect stitching, and, and the factories look at you like you're crazy. Like, why? Why do you want that? You don't need that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not what we sell. Like, that's not what we sell the most of. We sell 90,000 of these others, and you want us to do a thousand of these? That's crazy. Why? Why do you want to do this? I have to retrain all my people that they actually need to care about the stitching. And it needs to be in a straight line. And so there's, there is, a, there is certainly a uh, disconnect there, no doubt. Well, well it's funny because if you don't, a lot of the people that are getting these caps in, in a swag bag or whatever, they don't care. I mean, they're just, they're going to go on the shelf or they're going to go get thrown away or get donated to Goodwill or whatever. Ryan cares about his hats. <laughs> I care about my hats. So we, we actually had, we, we went back and forth quite a bit. Ron's like, we just get some hats off of Amazon. I'm like, no. Yeah, so if we're, get the cheap ones, if we're doing hats, I have a hat picked out. We're going to do quality. I mean, we're going to, we're going to get something that somebody's going to wear because I don't, you know, they're not going to buy something. They're going to spend 30 bucks on something that is a piece of crap. Uh, well, we'll do some. Uh, uh, we'll do some of these batter, battle born duckers caps for you guys. We have some lengths that are backs through and through. We'll get you hooked up, dude. I, and I, I will tell you, until we did our hats. So, Ron, how many times have you seen me without a Bex hat in the last year? Never. So I, I wear hats, I, or I'd have one on. I, I, oh, you're good. Man. I have a Bex hat on all the time. I, they're they're great hats. They're comfortable. A lot. My problem is being in the construction industry. I just I wear them out, and and it's not that they're worn out. The quality is still one hundred percent there, but they're stained and they're sweat stained and and all that stuff. And so I'm in your office quite a bit. As soon as you put a new hat out, if it's you know I, I I'm kind of particular. I'm not a flashy guy. But man, you put a camouflage hat out, and it's like, boom! I'm on the camouflage hat, you know. Yeah, we got quite a bit of camo now, and 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 there's so there's two reasons why I was late this morning. First of all, 
I was all backwards. Second of all, the only cap I had in my truck was sweat stain from yesterday. It, it had a double duty of, <laughs> of some, wood, some woodwork and the, the baseball game yesterday at 5 p.m. in the heat of the day, right? And so it was all sweat stain. I would typically wear it, and I almost did. I'm thinking, that's not really the classy thing to do. So I had to run by the office and get a, get a fresh cap. I'm glad you kept it classy for us. I'm trying really to, man. I'm, about to, it, man. I'm trying to, try to fake it till I make it, but, but there ain't really nothing classy about me, man. Well, well we're the same. I mean, we're... We're we're a bunch of rednecks. We're sitting in Ron's garage, and we took we literally to, to set this up. We're sitting there one day, and somebody's cover for a podcast. We're like, dude, we don't want all this stuff in the background. Let's throw up the duck blinds off I the love boat. It. You know, dude, these are the duck blinds off the boat. We hunt out of these. So it's a, it's original. And, and you talked about working with my hands. One of the reasons why I'd like to do that is because everything to, to me, design is everything. Right. And so originality. So a lot of the things we do at Bex, all the fixtures you see in the stores, a lot of the, 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 the different things, the die cuts, the extrusions. I, I love that. I, 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 I design that. I love it. I think about it and this and that. So this to me, this activation is awesome. It's dual purpose. Right. And um, so so t- 2021, every year at Bex, we have a, a new company theme that the team rallies around. This year, it's Kaizen. It's continuous improvement. It's a Japanese term for uh, Lean Six Sigma 5S manufacturing, and it, it is just continuous improvement, but it's also about limiting, eliminating waste, right? And so when I see this this right here, I love it because not only is it original, not only is it attractive and cool, it's dual purpose, man, right? If, if it wasn't this, you had something custom like this made up, it'd sit in the garage, get used a handful of times, but it's just taking up space. Yeah. This thing's awesome. I mean, it's kind of going, you talk about going back to our roots. It is going back to our roots, man, because you store this in the boat and then you can use it out there, but you could also use it right here. But this is speaking to your customer. This is who we are. You mentioned being a redneck. I'm a redneck, man. I'm proud of it. I don't think there's any other way. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It's a lifestyle. Right? Uh, as far as Beck sunglasses go, it's pretty easy. We're not Oakley. We might not ever be, and that's okay. In the old days, I used to get a little bit disheartened. Like, oh, man, maybe we'll never be that big. Well, we won't buy that big. But one thing I know and I can take a lot of pride in is that we provide a few jobs. Uh, this year, we were able to provide health care for everybody that works at Beck. That was a huge monumental thing. After 12 years, I was pretty stoked about that. Um, I was really proud of that, being able to do that. But at the end of the day, 85, 85% of every sunglass sold goes back into the company. I live in a modest house, uh, uh, drive dirt roads. I'm cool with that. That that's, To me, it's about putting food on the table for my kids. I don't have to have it all. And your employees, uh, too. That's it, man. And so it's it, Bex. That is Bex. And Bex is that person that's saying, hey, this is awesome. I love it. And that's not just lip service, man, because you come check ours. We're dual purpose and stuff, too, man. I love it. Oh, yeah. I think you are the redneck because the redneck, this is what we like. We like functionality. We don't want stuff to break. We want quality. But it doesn't have to be fancy. Right. And and we're all about the family and having a good time. But I'd no, say. That's what Bex is because your hats are quality. Your sunglasses are quality. You're, you you take care of your employees and you take care of your family. But he's also There's transitioned. Not about being a redneck. You, you look at Yeti, okay? Uh, you know, now this is going to be a plug for Yeti, and this is what I would say about Yeti. It's expensive stuff, right? Yeah. And they, 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 they're catering to exactly what you just said. And I don't know anybody at Yeti. I have no reason, whatever. I have some Yeti product, but... Nine times out of ten, it's really good product. It's heavy duty. It's going to last. And what I think they're figuring out is guys like us, and this is what we try and do at Bex, we can't go get a new pair of sunglasses every week or every month. The time's not there. There's too much going on. So me, if I'm going to go buy a pair of sunglasses, I want to buy a pair that's going to last me for a long time until I have time or, or need to go back and get another one because it's not. A, it can't be an everyday occurrence. Like... Like trip, the trip to town might only happen once every little while. Now, again, I watch Western, so I love the idea of a buckboard going into the mercantile. And stuff up. I, I think that's awesome, and we can relate to that a little bit in Logandale, right? But, yeah, we can. But that, to me, is the thing, right? It's not these, – these aren't luxuries that we can just go pick up. So these goods, they do have to last us, man, and, and it's pretty easy. You know, we are a loyal customer if the product performs the way it was intended to. We'll be – you know – uh, Jeremy Andrus uh, is a mentor of mine. He, he's the CEO of Traeger Pellet Grills. He used to be at Skull Candy Headphones, and I learned a lot from him. I used to call him, hey, man, I'll come sweep the shop, whatever I got to do to learn some things. And he told me something one time that stuck with me forever. I was asking him, hey, should we put money here? Should we put money there? He goes, I wouldn't do any of that. 
He says, I would just make sure that you're you're doing the things to take care of your customer. Because as long as you don't give them a reason to leave, they, 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 they likely never will. So if you got them, keep them. But don't give them a reason to leave. If you start to skimp on the, you, you talked about it. There's uh, Smith. Uh, the Smith, I grew up loving Smith Optics. I thought they were awesome before we started doing sunglasses. Now that company has changed hands. And you can tell. I can look at a product and I can tell. I know what to look for and I can tell. Now the consumer doesn't always, but nine times out of ten, they do. And so he just said, hey, man, if you give them a reason to stick around, they will. If you give them a reason to leave, they will. So well, it's, it's it's simple. It's simple advice, but it's true. And it's funny because your model, I mean, so you, you know, you started early. You're doing a lot of social media stuff. You were, it was a lot of, you know, in the valley around here. I Tim, Tim Ruiz was on with him with on the all around retrievers. You did a video with him. And what we're seeing now, you've got brands like Gigi that it's, it's a lot of show, right? So they come out and they do stupid stuff. But yours, I mean, literally, if people, I don't think people would ever understand. You drive down the boulevard, not only are you seeing it in a horse pasture, but your warehouse is the old barn. It was an old horse horse race training facility, and, and, and so it does. There's cattle roaming the pasture that's your, that's your pasture. You know, you've got a caretaker, a ranch manager that's, that lives on property, and, and so that lifestyle is ingrained in what you do. You, you go to work every single day, and that's what you're surrounded by, and I think that inspiration, and I, I think there is no – there's not a harder working working individual in the world than, than a cowboy and the American cowboy. And it's, it's a tough lifestyle. And you you grew up around that. You grew up around that work ethic and, and with your dad. And I think it shows, it shows in your product. And Ron's like, the redneck doesn't want things to be fancy. Well, I, I would disagree with it a little bit because you do, you have a solid product. It's going to last, but you're also, you've built style into it as well i think the redneck likes functionality more than fancy but but the, at the same point when you're running a brand like jason so he's got to have he's got to have the things that the ladies like too so he's got some some hats that are pretty pretty fancy and a little bit out there and, and cody that's cool and my, my everything's kid, unisex dude so my kid's a little bit i mean He's one of those kids that's a little bit out there. He, he's, he, he's rocking the mullet. It's Nevada mullet, right? That's his, that's his TikTok handle. And so he wants something a little bit flashier. And, and you guys have that. But it's still the same high quality. The same heart goes into it. The same attitude towards design. It's going to be different. It's going to be flashy to get that part of the market. But you don't sacrifice the, the, the brand and the value that the brand brings to it for that. So, so you're right, and we, and we try not to be something we're not. And and, and you mentioned the, the barn that we turned into a warehouse and these types of things. And and you know, at, at first glance, you might pull in there and be like, "I'm at the wrong place. Like I'm out of here," right? Because you'll see the glasses on Yellowstone TV show, you know. And you might think that these are some corporate building, but we don't have those, so that we can continue to offer a really good paying job for the people that live here. Right, that the people that work at Bex, because that stuff is important to me. I'll sacrifice a little bit off the top so that they get paid well all day, every day, have forever, and that's okay. I, I don't have to have it all. I don't need it all. I'd find a way to spend it that doesn't need to be spent, right? And so, but when you get in there, and I tell people, hey, we might have the might have not have top quality drywall in this facility, but when you get in there and you start to take the packaging and you start to un- unpackage the product, the lifeblood of the company. It's there, man. You can tell that the investment is there, that the time and the love and the care is in that product. Now, nobody bats 100. We certainly don't. I, I know uh, from experience that you've brought into some glasses to us that uh, we're having some paint, uh, we're, we're some inconsistencies in this and that. I I, I don't hide that at all, man. I love that. I, I'm, I'm grateful that you took the time to say, hey, man, is this supposed to be happening? Uh no, it's not. So let's get to the bottom of it. And those are the types of things that have made Bex better. I don't sweep those under the rug. No, we're not perfect. But I guarantee you, man, if we do find a chink in our armor or if we find a lapse in our in our production or our judgment or whatever, we do everything we can to rectify it and be 100% transparent in the process. Well, that's why. And to be honest with you, the only reason... So I'm not one of those ones. I'm not the Karen that's going to come in and say, oh, you this and that. and that. This is not me. And, and I would never go to Oakley and say, "Hey, there was a quality issue." Right. And, and I don't even want—I don't even want a new pair of glasses. But here's a quality issue. But I know with you, if you don't know, you can't fix that pro- that product. And if you can't fix it, then the, then the next customer that is the Karen—that's that's, going to be a lost sale for you. 
So for me, it's I know you care. And so I'm going to bring in the product and say, hey, just so you know, this is this is the issue I ran into. Yeah. Just so you know for future. So if there's something that maybe there was a missing manufacturing or something like that, that's on your radar. And if we don't tell people that they have a problem, and Ron and I talk about this all the time, how can I complain about somebody not hunting the right way if I'm not willing to teach them to hunt the right way? So, well, they're not always fun conversations. Right? No, no. And, and so I, I'm thankful that, that you, and, and you're not the only one that does that, brings it to our attention that sometimes it's valid, sometimes it's bad lighting, and then they, they don't know what quite what they're looking at. But either way, the customer is always right. And so... But but what 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 we what what happens? And I think you could talk to anybody at Bex, and this is where I'm maybe not always the nice guy that that seem, that seems like, but I'm always honest. I don't, it always is the same. I'll get in there and say, hey, this is happening with the product. We got to get it to the bottom of it. I've seen it this times. It's starting to become a pattern. What's going on? I need to know by end of business day tomorrow when you got this and that. And sometimes, especially people that haven't worked for me long, will try and pull the wool over my eyes and ah, uh-uh, no. Okay. No. No. Okay. I guess maybe you didn't hear me quite right. All right. All I I want to see you one time tomorrow, and all I want to see is 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 a, a resolution on what is going on and how we can get it fixed asap, so that we can get back to the customer and be a hundred percent transparent of what's going on. Because it's not just about giving them a free product. That that goes without saying. But what are we doing to, to, to dig down to the roots and, and prevent this problem from happening in the future? That is what I care about because. Because it's all about the product, man. Again, I go back to those first customers we have. I go back to hitting my knees saying, hey, if they'll be patient with us, I'll do my part. Well, part of doing my part is making sure that I can look somebody in the eye and ask the the price that we're offering for a com- comparable product that's going to meet those expectations. And to me, that's integrity, one-on-one. But I think if you look at your product, I think Dale Brisby did did an unboxing video. And, you know, everybody knows Dale Brisby is just he's a goofball anyways. Yeah. but. But he did it, and he was just like, "Yeah, this is crap." And he's just, he, and he's playing. It's it's satire, right? But you will notice that when you open that. I mean, it's every bit as comparable to any other sunglass product on the market. It's a it's a, a premium product. I mean, you've got a hard case on on most of your products. You've got the 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 uh, lens cloth and everything in the bag. It it is quality one hundred percent of the time. Tell me, you like it for duck hunting? What do you mean why I like it for you, ducks? You told me last year you like Bex for duck hunting because it doesn't fly the ducks. It's a, yeah, well, and, and it, it, so we, I actually had to change up my glasses. So I, I wear the guy, some Gabberts, some Gabbert 2s. Um, what I had, though, was everything was a mirrored, mirrored lens. Right. And, and so you're dealing with ducks. They're, they're extremely sensitive to everything. And so I was sitting there thinking, well, I'm probably flaring ducks just because of that. But there's a standard lens in the Gabberts too, so I went I went down and bought another pair of glasses, not because the glasses were bad or had issues, but because I want I needed that something that that wasn't that mirrored lens. And there's styles, everything from you can get kid styles to, you know, you can get if you need prescription glasses, you guys can provide the prescription glasses for them. The full frame, I, I wear the Gabberts. I love the Gabberts. They're some of my, my favorite glasses that I've ever worn. I, I've never had a glass, a pair of glasses that fit this well. That's not everybody's style. A lot of people like your aviator styles, and there's 50 different aviator styles that you guys have or something ridiculous like that. There, there's a little bit for everybody. I love uh, I love the styling of most of a lot of your hats. Um, I love the fact that you, when you do give back to the community, you created an entire line for the Moapa Valley Pirates because – we have one of the best football programs in the world, if you ask this community. But you walk into Jason's office, you could buy socks, you could buy hats. You could buy, he had a pair of Pirates sunglasses that, that were custom for that. And, and What about your fishing glasses? And then you do. You have a new line of fishing glasses. So maybe, tell us about that line. And so I, I need to bring you guys some 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 of the so fins. We have a fin and we have a cravali, and those are the two uh, full frame that I would say are are are, are the the. They're newer than the, the Gabbards that I think would work well for you guys because you're out there, you're, you're construction, you're building things, you're, you're hunting, you're fishing, um, and they're awesome. They'll pass OSHA and everything else like that, military rated and, and still still polarized. They're great. But So we, we collaborated with Favorite Rods, which is a, is, a, is a really, really awesome company in the fishing world. Uh, they make rods, reels, a lot of apparel and stuff like that. And so we did a Gabbard. It's called the Gabbard FX with them. Now they have more colors, you know that that's more of a fishing thing. They we got a white frame in them, but one of the things that I think would be cool uh, for you guys to try, just to give me some, give us some feedback on, is 
The one of them is an anti-fog, and it's still the black on black where it doesn't have any of the mirror and the shine and that, but it is an anti-fog, and it has an, and it comes with an anti-fog cloth as part of the packaging that that you know it's cold out or it's in the morning and you're on the water, or you're on you're out duck hunting, you could you could grab that cloth and give it an extra little bit you know of of edge on that anti-fog and. Me personally, I haven't been out there with it. I haven't, I haven't used it a lot, you know, well, because would... because we're in the desert. It's dry here. There's not a lot of fog opportunity, right? But it is a cool. It's a great technology, and, and those guys do awesome. My favorite and Winston, and those guys are. They're and I will tell you, that's my only complaint with Beck sunglasses. It's not just Beck; it's any sunglasses I've uh, that you're going to wear. Is so when you're duck hunting, you're covering your face. That's the only thing you have open is where your sunglasses are going, so it's trapping that moisture. And so, if I have to have if I have to have a full face mask on, then I'm not wearing sunglasses because I, you can't see. So that instantly fogs. So it'd be a great product to get you guys some feedback on, and, and to get these duck hunters that, out there that are having. I know they're experiencing the same issues. Yeah. And, and the cool thing about it is, you're you really want to know what's working and what's not working, and and. So you can create the best product for for those groups and yeah. call them duck blind glasses. No, you no, know, but you're right, and and coincidentally, so we're working on a new product right now called the Patrol, and uh, so we launched not too long ago what's called the Heroes Program, and it's basically any law enforcement first responder. It's currently any active because it's easier to verify but yeah. long term we're going to adapt that program to any retired past anything like that but it's 50 percent off now you don't we don't say 50 percent off until they're verified so if they come to the website the heroes program it's 50 percent off so we're trying to design some new products that are specific to that line long term we'd like to make some of these frames here in the u.s uh, right now we only make two frames in the u.s but we're trying to expand to that a little bit especially for some of these law enforcement this heroes program that's more of a plastic frame those things are easier to do than some of the metal stuff, right? All of it's too hard, and the whole process is robust, which is why there's only one sunglass company besides Oakley that's still in the U.S. doing a lot of that. But um, but this Patrol, one of the versions has some venting in it for what you're talking about. Now, here's the thing. The reason why we never had it to this point is because it's been a bit of a challenge and a bit of a process design, from a design language aspect to design it in a way where it doesn't just look funky or it doesn't, you know, it's because because the, the goal is, is to wear something that isn't. Now, I love it mm-hmm. if every time you went running, you bought a pair of Beck sunglasses for that. And every time you went hunting, you bought a pair for that. I mean, yeah. ideally, I think every brand would like that. But that's not who we are. I buy one pair of glasses or I wear one pair of glasses and I wear them for everything. So the, what's been challenging is is create a design language that still fits that everyday sunglass that doesn't look like something that you should wear only time, only on early morning duck hunts as opposed to late night duck hunts or whatever it is, late evening, you know? And so it is, it is, that's been the challenge, but that is on the way. It's called a patrol. It's a great sunglass, full frame, which I know you like. And it's going to be, it's, we're really excited about it. It's going to be a awesome really really full kind of edgy and and casual yet sporty and great fit just everything we're known for well, you got glasses that your boy bought oh he got he bought pit vipers yeah oh, uh, that's the kid, thing right now yeah right? and and Especially that's it goes with his 80s mullet so, so no, Bex is not going to chase the pit bike. <laughs> we, we, we get that question all the time. As a matter of fact, you brought up Yee Yee, and our, our marketing manager was like, what if we were to do some of this type of stuff? And I said, no, we, we, we're Bex, man. We, we don't yeah. chase those types of things. It's kind of like my kids. My kids, uh, you know, they're like, I'm like, come give me a hug, sweetheart. And she'd be like, well, I'll give you a hug if. And I'll say, no, nah, I'm, I'm not doing that, right? That's kind of how I feel with, uh, with Pit Viper. And they've done a great job. And that's just the power of social media. And digital online advertising with Facebook and Instagram, things like that. There's a lot of these companies that are that are sprouting up. That it's basically a dollars and cents thing, right? If we spend X amount and put enough ads out, and we sell, we're gonna sell. If we get 25% of those people that click it, we sell this much, and it simply is a numbers game. And all those brands you see popping up are doing that, and it's awesome. Hey, kudos to them. They're 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 doing a great job. But for us, it's more of a marathon, not a sprint. 
Hey, so I got one other question speaking of Facebook. Have you seen those glasses they put on? You can see the fish under the water. <laughs> it's polarized. But it's yeah. polarized, and Jason's, everything back to those is polarized. Yeah. That's all it is. So, so, okay, because I was like, is that magic? Is no, it's it's, it's, it's polarized. Oh, it's and a kayak for 10 bucks on Facebook. We almost bought it. Yeah. So all that stuff's called direct response marketing. Okay. So, so all they're doing right there is it's clickbait. They're saying, hey, look at this and this and that. And again, it's great. You see a lot of companies doing really well on that. But what they're doing is they're not, there's not, there's no new technology. They're just doing a better job than the rest of us probably, right? Yeah. And so that's all it is. But yeah, that's the polarization that cuts through the glare. And then the anti-reflective coating, like we have anti-reflecting. First of all, every single pair of sunglasses we've ever made mm-hmm. is polarized. Now, the, the problem we have, we have a lot of pilots and a lot of aviators because you, you mentioned the ideals and what Beck stands for. They're like, dude, we want to wear your stuff. We, we support you guys. We love what you're doing. But our, our, our aircraft is, uh, all the windows are polarized. And so it's kind of like a two negatives attracting, right? Is, is if you wear a pair of polarized sunglasses in a plane, you basically see black. Um, and it, that would not, that's not an easy decision because we basically have to go against everything we've ever stood for just to make these sunglasses for the aviators. But I love that they are fans and I love that they love what they're doing. I want to support that. But as of right now, everything that we've ever produced is polarized. It all cuts through the glare like that. The inner reflection coating, which you see on the back, which is either like a purple or a green, that is to prevent when you're looking in the water, that Uh is to prevent a dual reflection. So you cut through the glare that way. And if you didn't have that coating, it would cut through the glare this way. And you would see your, your eyeball in the lens. Oh, really? You wouldn't be able to see. And so, so there's 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 a method to the madness. We use a we use a hydrophobic and a oleo, oleophobic, which is to try and um, eliminate the, the 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 fingerprints and the hydrophobic is to try to repel the water. So everything that we do, there's a reason for it. Well, Jason's got. I mean, the cool thing about it is Jason's got a lot of programs. The Heroes program we we posted on our on our Facebook page when that first came out. Um, the latest initiative is you just became partners with the National High School Junior Rodeo Association. Mm-hmm. And so the, that they get a really, really good discount on their stuff, anybody that's a member of that. But it's it goes with your value. It's giving back to that program, partnering with those kids. And you've been – you did – well, it's, I guess we can't call it beer pong. It was like an oversized yeah. beer pong at, at the uh, Junior National Finals last year, I think it was, or the year before, or whatever. It's, COVID's made everything yeah. kind of run together. But but you sponsored that and sponsored, and you actually had it was a buckle program for that yeah. one you did. And, and, and so you're doing a lot of these things for these kids that, you know, I, I think what you're doing long term. So you're creating a brand with these kids that they're going to remember. So you go to a rodeo and it's it's hard to see people not wearing a pair of Beck sunglasses somewhere. And it's out here. I will tell you out here, if you go to an event out in the, in the Wampa Valley, dude, there's Becks everywhere out here. And it's because they are. You've been so good to everybody that they're, they're supportive. But they wouldn't be supportive if it, was, if it was garbage product. And you're making premium product. And so people try it to support you, I think, sometimes. And then they're, they're stuck. I, I bought for a sunglass just to support to support yeah. a brand and then now I've never turned back and, and, and we're grateful for that and and so as of right now just at January 1st 2021 I went in and I, to, I told our staff I'm like hey I want every local 50% off now that discount used to be 30 like and, and and some of our team members looked at me like I was crazy and I said listen I want everybody here to wear our product not just because of the monetary value or, or, or the income or anything like that it's because hey we're Beck's you know, we're, this, this place was settled by some of the toughest pioneers that you, saints that you'd ever imagine. Like that's still, our product is tough. Like we need to pair those things together and take some pride in that. And so, so, um, and right now we're in the process of, because just like any business online, especially online, we do a lot of online businesses, we get returns. And so we're going to start putting all the returns out on the floor for, you know, pennies on the dollar just again to, to get some of that product out there people that maybe couldn't can't afford them at an msrp to still be able to enjoy that product and get to see the things that you have and stuff and so as far as the nhsra goes i was a i never won the nationals but i won second with my brother he was an all-around champion matches out won it that that was a huge part of our childhood growing up and again those things it's more than just about the business uh productivity of that stuff it's 
I take a lot of pride in giving back to those things because they helped me get to where I was. We went to high school rodeos every weekend that I can remember when I was a, a young guy. And so, I, hey, if, if I get to a point and, and the business is to a point where we can kind of help give back no different than the companies that were involved at that point, which a lot of them still are, give back, then that's what I want to do. So I remember, uh, I'll tell you a short story. Uh, my brother and I were Wrangler endorsees for eight years when we were rodeo and gave us free product and this and that. When we were kids in the National Little British Rodeo Association, we would, we would haul all summer. There was a new brand coming out. I'm not going to name the brand, but they were coming out and they were making a book push. And they came up and they tried to either give us some sunglasses or some, 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 it wasn't sunglasses. They tried to give us some, some product or a certificate. I don't remember. And I remember my mom, who's a real loyal lady, a good gal. She's salt of the earth, man. And I remember her looking at us and saying, now boys, Wrangler has supported you all along the way. I would sure hate to see you leave them for everything that they've done. And that stuck with me, man. I mean, it stuck with me. Still to this day, I wear Wrangler. If I go rope, I wear Wrangler. Now, doesn't mean the other companies don't 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 make a great product. They do, and they're doing a good job. But again, I, I'm my, my mother's son, and and her counsel still rings true to me to this day because she did a heck of a job. Her and my parent, my father both did a great job. And hey, you know what? It made sense. It was very sensible what she said, and it made a lot of sense. And they supported us, so I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the same. So it's loyalty we don't have much of anymore. Well, I think we're. We would kept you for forever. I mean, yeah. it, you've quick. been on a, a really long time, almost? almost two hours. So okay. we're we're a little bit short of two hours, man. Jason, we th- I appreciate you coming on. It's been a time. Of, I know you're super super busy. You got a ton on your plate. We appreciate everything you've done for our community, man. And and we anytime you want to come on, I mean, you're more than welcome. If you got any product to promote, whatever you have, any initiatives you want to do. Is there anything that you have going on right now that you want to want to promote or anything like that? No, man. I, to thank you guys for the invite, and I'm grateful. And Haley's asked me a few times, and we've either been gone or, but I've been looking forward to it as well. So, but what I want, what I do want to do is, I want to get some caps made up for the battle born duckers. You know, some maybe some black, whatever color we have. Get them done up, and let's do a few extras uh, and, and a pair of some glasses for for some of your listeners. Let's give some away and do something fun that way. I think it'd be cool. Perfect, that'd be, that'd be awesome. And like like you like you said, man, we can't thank you enough, and we can't thank you enough for what you do and how you do it without looking for the praise. You know, that's that's big. And um, I didn't know how good your product was until you came on the show today. And it's because you don't ever toot your own horn, man. But you're you're very knowledgeable about what you do. And I can tell you care and and uh, can't can't thank you enough for having that drive and that passion and bringing those products to the market that we wouldn't have without guys like you. So well, thank you guys. I always tell my wife, I said, you know, I want to leave something. I want to do something more. And, and 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 and, but I have to look back and say again, it comes back that the the it comes back to the people. The people that are at Bex, right? The the people that, that that are involved at Bex, the people like you guys are talking about. To me, I, sometimes I, I overlook that, and I'm like, man, am, am we really, are we really providing a service? Like when I when I'm done here, am I gonna? Is this gonna be something I'm gonna be proud of? I mean, I ask those questions. It's no different than anybody, right? Yeah. But to hear you guys talk about it, I'm super grateful. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I, I love this. This is this is right up my alley, man. Make no okay. mistake about it. We'll have to get you in a duck line next year. We'll get a little bit of time to do that. But yeah, be fun. we'd love to get you out there. So. Yeah, we'll have to do that. I wish I knew where some geese were. Yeah, I, I don't know. But hey, if you hear yeah, gunshots late at night. <laughs> so I, I got to tell you, there, there was a neighbor one time, and we put some banners up like we did the signs because we got the real estate, just put it up. Why yeah. not? And they went and put one of these banners up like what you guys have behind you. And we had a couple of the neighbors call, and they're like, hey, we can't see the geese now. <laughs> uh, can you please take? Can you please take that down? And it was kind of funny. I thought it was pretty cool. You know, they sit out there and they would just watch them beautiful geese, man. And I told you Gannon, you cinnamon till on your property all the time too. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. And I told Gannon, I'm like beautiful ducks out there. We need to get Jason to let us on that property for a little bit to hunt. And Gannon's like, dude, I've tried. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny. I think the neighbors would take pickets and come out there because, like I said, that's that's enjoyment, that's recreation for them. But no, there's some beautiful. The neighbors stuff would on shoot back, huh? Yeah, there's some there's some beautiful stuff on that property. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, as we always say, you know, if you're going to go out, make sure you take one. If you can't take one, teach one. And if you can't do either, make sure you're hunting hard this next week. Thanks, guys.